<clears throat> All right. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Let me bring it up here, and we'll get going. So we're live with you guys on the. Uh, What's going on, everybody? On the YouTube's. Bring you fellas up here online, and then we'll get moving. Hey, y'all! Check out the shirt. You like that shirt? I like that shirt. Look at that. Top of my chest. Should flex the boobies at him. I don't have much. <laughs> Not much. Not a ton. Cool. So uh, we're up and running, and we'll get going here. All right. Guys, welcome to the podcast. Episode 20. Is it 20? 20. Wow. We're doing it. We're doing the thing. 20. All right. Um, so guys, I'm going to start this off with a, um, a bit of a ramble. Um, and this comes from the... Um, I, I made a recent post on Instagram where I was talking... Um, Basically, that you're your own, you're your own biggest obstacle. You're the own biggest enemy that you have, regardless of what you're doing. And I'll talk, I'll, I'll read it off again, and then I'll talk about where it came from, and then see if this kind of resonates with you. So, here's the post. It was there's a special moment of relief at the end of a training session or competition, as your coach gathers everyone together for one last huddle to finish a class, or the ref raises the hand of the victor. You realize the struggle is over, you did what you set out to do, and the white flag of your enemy has been raised. But the enemy is not your opponent at the competition, nor is it your training partner, it's yourself. A battle was waged and won that day, an internal siege has been lifted. As the army of your own anxiety, harsh judgments, and laziness were beaten back, defeated were the thoughts of skipping training, sitting out another round, or avoiding the upcoming competition because deep down you, you're afraid that you're not good enough. Regardless of the outcome of that day's training or competition, what matters is you conquered yourself. And tomorrow the forces of your shadow will reappear as they do every day, ready for another battle and looking for a weakness in you. But where there is a shadow, there is light, and that light comes from the strength, intelligence, and intensity inside of you. Embrace the suck, take joy in the daily battles, whether on or off the mat, because every day you choose to follow your heart, take action, is a day that the enemy inside of you becomes a little weaker, your light a little bigger, your shadow a little smaller. So here's where I was getting with that. So for me, I mean, everybody has their own struggles, right? Everybody has something that kind of gets to them in a different way. But I was at a hot yoga class and hot yoga whoops my ass. Like it, it, I, I just don't deal well with the heat, right? And I'm not particularly good at, I'm not very f flexible or bendy. So it's, it's very tough for me. But at the end of the hot yoga class, I don't know if this is how they all do it, but they bring you that cold towel. It's a frozen towel. And that's kind of the signal that like, we're done. You made it, right? And for me, that whole class, a lot of times, I'm in there like battling with my own self. I'm like, man, God, I just want to get out of this room. I'm drenched in sweat. I feel like I'm, I'm almost like getting dizzy or something. You know, I just don't feel good. You know, you're in this hot room. You feel like death. But as soon as they bring out the hot, the cold towels, I'm like, oh, there's the cold towel. It's almost over, you know. And at that point, I realized, like, I was sitting there and I thought about, I was like, man, like I was battling with myself the whole time, right? It's, I'm not worried about what anybody else is doing. I'm just trying to stay in the damn room. And I've even had situations and competitions before where I didn't think that I could win. It was a big competition coming up, and I really, deep down, I was just like, man, I'm not good enough. But I've kind of gotten used to this thing where I just put myself out there regardless, and I won. I was like, I went out there and killed it. You know, and at the end of the competition, you know, the outcome sometimes is, is not as important as it is I conquered my own bullshit because my anxiety and my own like self-doubt told me, don't do this thing. Don't go to the competition. You're not good enough to win. But I was like, F it. I'm going to go, right? I'm going to do it anyway. And I did it. And, you know, I realized that, you know, the biggest obstacle for me was me, right? That's the big, biggest hurdle for me a lot of times is getting out there to do it. Now, some people may not have problems with going to jiu-jitsu training. They may not have trouble with hot yoga like I do, right? But it could be something like food, right? Like a lot of people want to be you know, better looking with their clothes off, right? But they eat shitty food. They can't stop eating ice cream and cookies. So this thing could be just at the end of the night when they get ready to lay their head down on the bed, they could be like, ah, the day's over, right? That's the ending for the day. And I didn't eat any BS that day. I ate all good food, lean meat, vegetables, you know, and healthy carbohydrates. Again, we all have our own struggles. And so to me, like a lot of times when you get to those points where the training session's over, the day's ended, the whatever it is, right? The competition's over. When you get that ending ritual, right? There's some, some ritual that basically concludes it, right? In, you know, a lot of times with us, we either huddle together and do our chant or we'll line up on the wall. Um, cold, the hot yoga, you get the cold towel, you know, whatever your little ending thing is at the end of that thing, a lot of times you realize, man, 
I'm the biggest problem for myself because again, maybe you were being lazy about coming into training. Maybe you almost sat out around. Maybe, like you know, we were just talking about that about you last night. You know, maybe there's something getting in the way. And again, you, when you really look at it, you're every day you step on the mats, every day you train, every day you just live life. Period. You're kind of always just battling with yourself more than you're battling with anything else. You have the people, your competition, your opponents in the competition. You have your training partners who are you know trying to beat you, right? You have all these different things, but it, ultimately. It's about you conquering yourself overall, right? And every time you choose to take action towards the thing that you want is a moment where you become a little bit stronger and you choose to listen to that anxiety a little bit less, right? Like going back to the competitions where I've won, even though I thought I wasn't good enough sometimes, I've gotten accustomed to that, right? I understand that this little voice inside me is going to kind of self-doubt. It's going to undercut me a little bit. But I choose, and I understand this from experience, like I just don't pay attention to it because I know that there's more in me than I think there is. And I think a lot of times... With people, they have to take that cart before cart before the horse mentality, where they just have to put themselves out there, take action, and if they take action towards the thing that they want, whatever that might be, right, good things happen, right. Even if you completely flounder and you 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 get crushed in the tournament, something good's going to come of that. You don't know where it's going to be yet, but maybe it's down the road. But it's something's good's going to come from it. Even if you go to training, right, you go to training and you get absolutely squashed, right, something good's going to come from it. Don't know what it is, but something good's going to come from it. Even if it's simply fa the fact that you develop the habit of continuing to do the thing that it is that you wanted to do. So that was a little ramble for today. Um, what do you think about that? Like, I mean, like from your own experience, like, um, do you agree or disagree with that? What are your thoughts? I think it <clears throat> it depends on the the situation. Mm. Um, yesterday, I felt like crap all day. I don't know why. I was just feeling really weak. Very kind of just out of it. Yeah, you think and it was more of like some... I think I had some kind of bug or bug. something. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I went to jiu-jitsu anyways. And I've had a really hard time getting to train uh, just because I've been so busy with, you know, uh, with the kids and the business and all that stuff. So I made it out there. I did the first class. And, I mean, I was just beat. I was so tired. And uh, I walked past, the like, into the, you know, dressing room to get yeah. like a water. <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> I went to the... Uh, to the locker room, and I sat there for a minute. I looked at my shoes. I just sat down, looked at my shoes, looked just stared, just stared. Like and I could I leave like, right now. I was like, "Were you thinking about leaving?" Yeah. Okay. Because I felt so bad. And I was like, "I know." Like I already, I already checked out. Like I'm, I was like, I already know. I'm probably gonna have a bad session. Mm -hmm. I'm probably gonna have a bad training session. And I was like, "Screw it. I don't get in often. I'm just gonna go." Yeah. I'll see how I feel. And then we started doing like. Clock chokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it zaps you even more. Like yeah, yeah. you're getting choked quick over, and it over. just like takes that energy out of you. And so I was a little tired. And then uh, I was just like, screw it. I'm just going to stick around. You're like three rolls, six minutes, two minute break. And I was like, let's just see what happens. Yeah. I'll just do the best I can. And um, it was it was rough. It was mm -hmm. tough. I was like, I wanted to just be done. Like after the second, um, after the second roll, I was like, I think I'm done. Like, mm -hmm. I need to be done. And uh, I'll roll with Tony the second roll. So it was a tough roll. Tough roll, you know, yeah. The black belt, he's tough. We, not a huge guy, you know, so he's very technical. We're always moving. He caught me in a damn shoulder lock this morning. Did he really? Caught me sleeping. Good for him. Caught man. me in the shoulder lock and he's I wasn't awesome. ready. Yeah, he's I good. love rolling with Tony and, you know, he, he caught me in a, like an ankle lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, <clears throat> that dude never taps, by the way. Like, I will get him in something. I was like, dude, he's dead to rights. And he was fucking get you, out you, of the room. You got to get it. You heal tap, but you got to like, get your it. old ass bones. You got to, you got to make him, you heal, he, he's going to make you earn it. Yeah, he will. Yeah. And, and so I was pretty fatigued after that. And then me and uh, Rob went and Rob, like I always have a hard time with him just because his style and, and he's a purple belt, which means fucking nothing. But he's, he's one of the toughest dudes in the room. His style matches up. So he's got this pass and he's always does this like little standing uh -huh. pass and he, for some reason, like some people have a really hard time with my guard. He has just he sliced through it. Yeah. He just does. Style matchup. And uh he got he, first of all he threw me, which he's been working on this throw and I caught him off it a few times with submission off it because mm -hmm. he dude, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful throw. Like he threw me, I landed on the on the ground on top of me, and I was like, dude, that was beautiful. That was a great throw. I told him. <laughs> and he's like, Yeah, that was the best one I've done. And uh man, he just went after me and, and he really put it on me. Put it on me. And afterwards I was just like so distraught. I, I mean, literally, I just I, I couldn't move. Yeah. I was so tired. Um, I don't know that that for me that's kind of a it's a double edged sword because I probably should have listened to my body. Probably should have because I wasn't being a punk like I don't want to roll or I'm avoiding rolling. I, I love it. You yeah, know, I didn't get the reason why I stuck around is because I'm getting in there such a limited amount of time. I want to make it count. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was such a physically it was tough and then yeah. mentally it was tough because Rob got the better of me. 
you know, substantially. And um, for me, it was mentally tough. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I think I've had a hard time being in my head about... Well, you're, you're always in your own head. Yeah. You're probably, I mean, you're you're worse than I am. Um, about, no, I mean, it, 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 I mean, we all got, we all got our things. Like, yeah. but you, like, I'm I'm very up in my head, and I have yeah. a lot of anxiety. And I just overthink things, and you're yeah. even worse than I am. Yeah, sometimes. I think like um, we think about your ego. We talk about that all the time. You think about your ego. What's other people going to think about me? Are they going to mm-hmm. judge me? My shitty brown belt. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. And, and like I think my body of work. You know, me, my consistency being on the mats for 10 years, I mean, you know, having a bad day is having a bad day. So, yeah. And I wouldn't even say I had a bad day. Rob's just fantastic. And, well, and it, it was, a, you know, there's these combinations of things. And this is something that happens anytime you train with someone for a long period of time, right? You're going to have bad days. You'll have good days. So there's some days where you're going to come in, you're going to catch Rob. You're going to catch him slipping. And you're just going to put it to him. And there's days where Rob's going to come put it to you. Because, again, you know, brown belt and purple belt, those are very close. Like, I yeah. think, you know, purple belt to black belt. At that point, you know, there got you know, if I if I mean, for instance, like when I when I rolled with Rob for the first time, he was a blue belt, good blue, but it probably should have been purple. Yeah. But he come he came into the gym, and for my first round with him, I was like, I'm gonna just take it slow with him, and he came right out of the yeah. gate, and I was like, whoa, right? Yeah. Like he, yeah. he you know, he, he's a tough dude. So it's one of those things where you're gonna have these these days where again. You know, if you come in, like you're, you, some days you're going to be the hammer, some days you're going to be the nail. And we say this, but when you're the nail, it, is, it isn't so fun. But it's one of those things where, it, you know, again, having those training partners that can push you, mm-hmm. it's, it, it'll piss you off sometimes because yeah. you're like, damn, I thought I was better than that. Which you're not bad. It's just one of those things where, again, they're going to push you and you're going to push each yeah. other. You know? Well, I think uh, mentally it's tough to deal with. You know, somebody getting better, it's tough to deal with that. But why so? Um, just because you hold yourself to a certain standard. Like I expect a certain standard of... My right, the, 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 the ego says, I'm supposed to do this. But I realized that, I'm like, what did I do that whole time? Mm. I did nothing. Yeah. I had no takedown. I literally, like, I went in my head and I was like, what was the takedown I was going for? Right. What was I trying to do? Was mm-hmm. I trying to pull guard? Was I trying to do this? What was I, tra- what was I trying to do? Nothing. Mm-hmm. I wasn't doing anything. I, I, you know, I was not in the right frame of mind. I just wasn't. And so, I mean, like on, on a situation like that, I mean, you have to like sit back because the, the biggest thing that I see people do, and I'm guilty of this as well. We all are at some point. And it, maybe it is in jujitsu. There are people out there that really don't give two craps about their, you know, they like train and if they get smashed, like whatever. But a lot of us at some point have something built up in, a, in an area of our life where if we underperform, we we pass a hard judgment on ourselves, not what happened, not the, not the thing, right? Meaning... Fuck, like I get so you get pissed off at yourself, beat yourself up. Man, yeah, exactly. man, I suck, right? Like I suck today, right? And now, nah, like let's let's take a step back and let's look at it. Like you know, for for you, for instance, it's like, well, you know, Rob, when Rob rolls with you, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to be on your game to to deal with him, if, even if you're fresh and healthy, right? Sure. So then, if you say, well, I'm not feeling very good today, I'm pretty beat up, I've been been out, and I'm feeling a little under the weather, I'm not gonna be at my best. Right, so honestly, in that situation, your goal and that that training class should have been like, "Fuck it, I'm just here. I'm here." And I've had those days. I had one of those days like three weeks ago when I came back from the Nogi Pants. I was just zapped, bro. Mm-hmm. And I remember I rolled with Albright, right, in the uh, the seven o'clock class. And for you guys listening, Albright is this brown belt who is about two hundred and five, two hundred ten pounds, and he's about like five nine, five ten, yeah. and he's so strong. Like he he's. He, like on on a good day, I've got to be on my game, and I was not having a good day. I he literally just beat the crap out of me. Yeah, and he, he he's even so much so he was like, man, stop taking it easy on me. He's like, I'm not taking it easy on you, brother. <laughs> I I just got nothing. But on those days, I'm literally like I'm there and I'm training because I want to. But at the, I I have no expectation for right. myself. But then, like you know, if you if you were holding yourself to some expectation, look back at it like that, yeah. where you say, okay, well, what did I do wrong? What objectively, what could be better about this situation? Could I have gone for more takedowns? Could I have had? How is he setting up this guard pass again? He needs that collar behind my neck, so maybe I need to do a better job of keeping my yeah. hands up. You can look at those things objectively and make objective, you know, um, sort of, I guess, views of it rather than simply taking going back and being like. Man, I suck. You know, that's the initial. That's the initial thought, and that's the initial thought for me. It's always been like that. You know, your self doubt. Most people like are. That. So it what takes I, consciousness to what I do. Back. What I did, and what I've always done. I've gotten, I think, better at it. Is I've like it's given me. It's given me a a reset point. Like, okay, you need to check some, look at some things. Right. Have a purpose, like we talked about in last podcast. Have a purpose. With training, mm-hmm. have a you know a technique or like I'm gonna fight off grips or whatever that is. 
have a purpose, you know, and I think it'll help. You know, I think it, it will, it just, it's reset me, you know, because I want to compete in Cincinnati and uh, it's definitely has, you know, a little fire under me for sure just to uh, have, get, get more benefit and get more, more out of my training, which right. I feel like I was just kind of there. So yeah, and I mean, like, but what I'm saying is, is again the uh, the rough days, right? Like those rough days, you can't let them frustrate you too much, you know? Because again, if you look at it for what it is, it's something helpful, sure. Right? The thing is, is that people, like you said, when they build up an expectation of themselves, a standard for themselves, and they undershoot that, right? The ego has the ego has then said you were supposed to be this or that, right? And then you don't do what it is that you're supposed yeah. to do. Then you start going, you start second guessing yourself, you start getting frustrated with yourself, absolutely. You know, and then that's when you just got to back up. Like, whoa, 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 right? It's it, it really isn't about the outcome of that training session. It's about the fact that you trained, mm-hmm. right? Like the videos that I do are a great example, right? Like okay, like if I put out a video, maybe I thought it was a good video and it gets no views for some reason, right? Well, it doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing videos. I don't suck at videos or whatever. I mean, I still share a lot of stuff. Just this one wasn't a good one for some reason. It didn't speak to people. Right. But you keep going. And if you have those training sessions, you just keep humming along, man. Yeah. You know? And you can't really, you you, you can't hang on to them too much because then they'll get in your way of your, your training. Right. Your you know? progression. And yeah. so, yeah, it's nice. But, but, you know, from anything that I've read and I've learned is that you have to have the bad days. Have to have them. You don't have a choice. Yeah. It's not that you have to have them. You just don't have a choice. They're yeah. going to come. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it, you, th- I mean, you think about it, like some of your best stuff probably came from bad days. Yeah. You know, like it, sure. it's the day. Well, I mean, if everything goes fine, right. Well, then you're like, oh, well, I'm good. Right. But it's like, like for instance, some, I've seen you do your best competitions right after a competition loss. Yeah. Right. Cause you'll go to a tournament and you lose. And then you're like, I'm wired. You're, you're, you're zoned in. You're like, I got to go. And then you'll go compete at the next tournament and you'll friggin' kill it. Yeah. Because you're more focused because that loss put a fire under your butt. Right, and so same thing for me. I've had situations where, you know, uh, again, I had some, like, you know, most of most of my uh, areas that I've like where I really was weak at at one point, and, and then I covered them up. Came from losses, like my ankle locks. I remember I got like uh, ankle lock twice at a tournament, so I was working on those. I, basically, I I was always in that position working on it. Um, triangle chokes. I remember Colin put me in a. Basically, I got stuck in a try. I was getting caught in triangle chokes because I passed head forward a lot. Right. And I didn't at the time. I was a purple belt. I didn't know how to defend them properly, so I was getting triangle choked at competition. So Colin put me in a triangle choke every roll. I started for a month. I started in a, a locked triangle. Bro, that sucks. Like I spent the first like week just trying not to go to sleep because every time I'm like getting choked out, getting choked out, getting choked out. But again, you get tough because yeah. you're there. And again. I can say that now you're going to have to have a damn good triangle to triangle choke me because again, I haven't tri- been triangle choked in a long time because of that month uh, uh, after the loss because yeah. it was like, here it is. But again, if I would have looked at it simply of the situation like, ah, I suck, well, that's not very helpful. Sure. But if I was like, man, I, I got caught with this particular thing, what could I do better with right. it, right? And then you work on from there. Yeah. You know, so those bad days are going to come, but they're not really bad days. If you look at them, they're like, man, these are chances to grow. Sure. They're only bad days if you perceive them to be bad. It's always perception. Yeah. You know, things can only be bad or good depending on the way that I look at them. And that's where you have to like, you have to, you have to catch yourself. Right? We all do it. You know, we, we start to get down that negative loop. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's not a bad thing. It was a training day. It was a good damn day, right? Yeah. Because one day you're going to be an old man getting ready to kick the bucket and you're going to be like, man, I wish I could have one of those bad days, right? But from it, you're like, okay. I'm a little bit more fired up now. I'm getting ready for the Cincinnati competition. I have some things to work on, and it's going to kind of get you going a little bit. It's not really a bad day. Just, again, bad if you look at it as you didn't uphold whatever standard you set for yourself. Mm -hmm. But as far as your training goes, you trained. You improved a little bit regardless of what you think, and you'll be better for it. Yeah, I think mentally I didn't quit. You know, I kind of just sat out. and could have. You know, and I probably should have, actually. Mm -hmm. Now I think back because now I'm, like, getting in the sauna and trying to, like, sweat some shit out and just trying to get better and... I woke up last night like sweating like crazy. It was, oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. But um, yeah, I, th- I think if you take something positive from it and you learn from it, and uh, I think mentally I took something from it more than physically, yeah. obviously. But um, so we were going to talk about we got a fun event coming up. Cool. I'm going to move this camera real quick. All right. So put the shirt back, back of my head. The back of your head is. Um, oh. Sorry. Oh no. We'll move it. Look at that. See if you can get in that bad boy. What's that? So guys, we're gonna actually talk about suit rolling. Um, If you guys have never done suit rolling, Chewy's got a video on what suit rolling is. And I'm gonna let him kind of uh, 
lead this because it's the craziest, most fun, weird. It, it's just like everybody ripping each other's clothes off, kind of <laughs> in a great way. It never start. It didn't start yeah. off that way. So, <laughs> tell you know, I I don't know how many years we've had, how many years have we had suit rolling. Um, let's see. So it'll be. We started off in 2012. Okay. That was our first year doing suit rolling. So this will be our, I guess it's our sixth year. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do have to say like the costumes or, or the suits, quote unquote, if you can even. Yeah. Some of those aren't uh, suits, man. They're not suits. They're not I wore suits. a robe. Last year I wore a robe and like a, like a fisher hat you, or something. You always wear like <clears throat> as little clothing as possible. The <laughs> less y'all can choke me with. You, uh, because I, <laughs> what was it? Like 2015, you had the Abe Lincoln hat on and, a, and like a bow tie. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I remember there's a video of me, like, I pulled it back and, like, it let it go and it snapped right back <laughs> at the neck. It was one of those, like, it was a fake bow tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, got, it's on the... Uh... It's so good. Yeah, so uh, so how did suit rolling, where'd you get the idea? How did it come about? So, it was a, it was on a Saturday after training. Um, my buddy, you know, Justin Court, one of our brown belts now, he was a blue belt at the time. And uh, Justin Court was, uh, he was, like, a, a semi-pro, uh, you know, whatever, pro, like, snowboarder. Like, he was, like, you know, doing that almost full-time, just okay. doing snowboarding, right, yeah. out, out west. And he said that him and his snowboard budding buddies, they would go into like just be dumbasses, right? They would go to thrift stores and they would buy some these old suits and they'd go to Vegas, right? So they'd be walking around Vegas with these old tweed suits and stuff like that, just be you know being stupid, right? And uh, and then we, we somehow we got the idea like, man, let's like wear some suits and roll. Like he's like, wouldn't that be a fun idea? And I was like, that sounds awesome. So we left training and we went to the Goodwill. And we picked up a couple suits, and we were just going. And, and part of the fun was trying the suits because you start getting down this this oh, you you, be, you continue down this this road of ridiculousness. Like what what's going to be even more ridiculous than this suit? And uh, we all got our suits. There was only about like six of us or something the first the first year, and um, and then the next year it grew, and next year it grew, and it just continued to get bigger until like God, last year it was just a mess. Like la- last year was ridiculous. Like I actually have the videos; they're actually getting cut right now. Um, for that last year's role, because I forgot, I, I literally had them stuffed away and I forgot all about them. I thought they were on an old hard drive that got, that crapped out, but it wasn't. So they're actually getting cut. So this year, you guys, uh, if you guys follow the YouTube channels, we'll have uh, a couple of suit rolling videos go back to back. One from last year, one from this year. But man, like it was ridiculous. Like Adam, Adam's costume last year, he came. Him and Chad. Chad was an old lady. Yeah. You know, he came out there with a cane and like this old lady hat, and Adam had on like a, a woman's suit and a wig. He had like leggings. Oh my god, like the it was <laughs> it was so ridiculous. Like, oh, but so so we started doing that, and then you know originally it started off just rolling the suits. Yeah. So we just rolled in the suits. We didn't do anything with it, and then the second year, I remember we were there, and for some reason, like you know, someone had like a their suit got ripped a little bit, so someone ripped it. And then, like, you know, everybody else, we all just started joining in. We're just ripping suits. And then by the third year, like, 2015, that's, like, the one with the video that's pretty popular. Like, where, like, me and Pabone had, like, the Miami Vice, like, the yeah, white suits yeah. and stuff. Dude, that year, you were in it. That year was, like, I mean, just, it was crazy. We're just ripping stuff up. We're not even, like, at that point, we're not even worried about the roles so much as yeah. we're just, like, let's see who we can rip up, you know, yeah. with the clothes. So it, it's taken on this crazy, crazy thing. And, you know, it's funny because a, a lot of people do it now. Like, a lot of people will do the suit rolling. Like, the, they do the on Instagram. They'll hashtag it or whatever, or I get tagged in it. And, uh, you know, then I've also, like, heard from certain people, like, with their coaches, they're, like, that like their coaches will tell them that's freaking so stupid. Why, why would you do that? And again, I, I I understand partly, but it's a lot of fun. So why do you why do you think it's a good thing? Why why do you enjoy doing this? Because it's fun. Okay. Like it, it, nothing. There's I mean like so here I'll I'll say it like this one. I will say that there was a moment where when we started doing the suit rolling, and you start to realize how. Like the the gi has some there's some like application from the gi yeah. over to clothing because you're like you're you even if it's not the same thing you just understand how to intuitively you understand how to manipulate clothing to your advantage because you've been training so long even if it's not the exact gi choke or the exact whatever you understand how to manipulate clothing a certain way right like ex- external sources you just understand how to do it intuitively so you got that. But the other side is it's just fun, right? And I think that what we do can sometimes it can be it's a really serious thing when you think about it. But it's fun to like do things that kind of again tear down the ego. Just like we were saying, we all have this this earth, this grind. We're all grinding, getting better, and there's an ego that we all exist that we're always fighting with. And you're doing something where you're just being completely stupid, right? Like it's so perfect. Like I think that people would do would do well to every now and then do something where it's like you know you 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 kind of get uncomfortable with how silly you're being. Because again, it's just like people take life too damn seriously, 
you know so it's like you know have some fun so i mean literally just me and my me and the me and the guys us right being a bunch of dumbasses ripping clothes off each other and it's hilarious right so do you, do you think fun. it's um so let, let's talk about like traditional jujitsu and sure. traditions in okay jiu-jitsu. okay um with some people thinking it's stupid yeah. from a tradition respect mm. aspect what do you say to that well, how do you feel about that I mean, it's, I don't see how anyway it's disrespectful. You know what I mean? Like I don't know how, why you would think it would be disrespectful because it's just it's it's different for sure. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that everybody should do it, and not even all of our students do it, right? It, it's it's like a small percentage of our students actually do it. But for those that do it, it's a blast, man. Mm-hmm. We have a hell of a good time. I mean, it's so ridiculous You're just laughing with people, right? I mean, there's nothing yeah. it, to me. It's like that. That's just fun. Like it just it's 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 an enjoyable thing to do with each other. And I'm not really much of a traditionalist. Right? I mean, I, I like to take things and I like to make my own stew. And one of the things that I like to do inside the gym is we do goofy stuff sometimes. Like we have tag team rolling in November. You know, we do this stuff. Like, I mean, like, you know, we got some of the coaches together for bourbon tastings and, you know, like, we, I mean, all kinds of dumb stuff. So I, I like to have fun with people. I think you're building a community. You know, I think that's a big part of it. Well, sure. And you're building buy-in. Like, we can have fun and, and we don't have to keep it serious all the time. You know, there's times where... We have classes and mm-hmm. we're just like, man, it's going to be roll after yeah. roll after roll and you get training. the fuck after it. Mm-hmm. And then it's just a fun day. When you show up for suit rolling, you just know you're just there to rip some, yeah. like just try to rip yeah. somebody's clothes off. And then then the person usually with the uh, most clothes left, everybody like just starts <laughs> yeah, yeah, just going after, after them, right? And there's shreds everywhere and we do a before and after picture, which yeah. is fun. And I think that, you know, for me, part of it is, is that when we're training, like one of the things I think that jiu-jitsu can do is it can help us tear down these walls we have again when we communicate with one another through day-to-day culture right we put up walls for people like so they don't really get to get down into who we are right like like i had a conversation with one of the guys today it's a, it's a very deep conversation about what's going on in his life we were basically just going back and forth and the only reason we can have that is because of these like long-term shared experiences that we've had mm-hmm. right and so i think that one of those things where when you have those walls up day to day like for instance if, if if i didn't know you and i met you out on the street i'm not going to start talking to you and like i'm going to be like like i have this wall this thing put up so you don't really get to know who i am but when we train and we go through all this hard training and all this stuff and then we do all this silly stuff right it tears down those walls because you know it's kind of hard to like you know take something off the table like as far as talking to someone when you've like ripped off their friggin suit off their backs you know mm-hmm. or or when you've choked them unconscious on accident one time you know you, you you're at this point you're kind of like through that stuff because you realize like m- m- like i trust this person to choke me yeah right like i trust this person to like you know like rip clothes off me or something you know it's just like it's just one of those things where it tears through some of that ego stuff because you're just you know you're just having a good time with one another. yeah well, what do you think um and i go back to you and eli Knight did a video okay. on like self defense with sure. t shirts and yeah. stuff like that. Do you think you've picked up some things, you know, from suit rolling, like maybe self defense things that you maybe didn't think of before? No, not really. I think it just, I think you understand the, like I said, you understand that like there's something to the key. Sure. Right? Like, okay, like, so again, you know, people can say what they want to, they have their own opinions. I do, I love both. I actually like Nogi better than I do the Gi. Right. But I understand that like you've, from training in the gi for years, I've learned to intuitively manipulate clothing, right? So if you have any sort of clothing on you, I'm going to be able to manipulate it in some way, even if it's even if it's a rash guard. If I can use the clothing, I can manipulate it, right? Unless you're just shirtless, unless you're, you're unless you're bare naked, right? If you've got any clothing on you, I can possibly use that as as an advantage for myself, right? No matter what it is, if, it's, mm-hmm. if you're attacking me with you know a shirt. Uh, with no shirt on and you got like a belt and some pants. I can use that belt in those pants. You know, I mean, I can grab a hold of stuff. I mean, so it's, right. you just understand that you you have this intuitive sense on how to manipulate it because you know the gi the gi becomes an extension of your body, right? It, you, you like you almost know where everything is. Like you know, like for instance, like when you go for collar chokes, you're really good with collar chokes. You just know where things are, right? Like you can't. It's not like you're put. You can put your finger on it and always explain it. You're just like I can feel it. I can feel that it's there. You have an intuitive sense of where this clothing is. That's attached to you, um, you know, and so it's it's something like that where you understand that you now have this sixth sense about the the material that's around right. you and this other person's body, and so I think that that was the biggest the biggest carryover. It wasn't so much that ooh I learned how to choke this guy out with his tie, yeah, which I, I did, but yeah, <laughs> but but you just understand that okay, like there's a lot more to this clothing stuff than what you think because you now from training in the you do have a lot more. Um, like I said, control than you think with someone that's clothing. And the tie is like a death sentence. Oh, the tie is like bad. if you're ever gonna get in a street fight, take your fucking tie. Take off. your tie off. First thing you do, or whatever, anything around your. It's neck. done. 
Literally, done. all you have to do is just grab the two ends, and you're and done. That's it. That's it. Yeah, it's. I'm like, man, if you're ever like a businessman or whatever, <laughs> so if you ever get a street fight, if you get attacked by a lawyer or or a business professional and they've got a tie, just pull that sucker from both ends. They'll be at, they'll be asleep. Oh in my god, ten man. seconds. Like, there's really no way to stop it. I mean, it's it's crazy. Well, one year someone like got their tie pulled. We had to cut it off because it got so tight we couldn't get the knot undone, so oh we had to like god. cut it off. So I tell them, like, don't wear ties, and if you wear a tie, we'll make it sure it's a clip on. Yeah, or just take it off. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, man, I uh, the one thing I learned we we talked about that video you did with like t-shirts. Okay. And um, you know, because you think t-shirts pretty thin material. If you mm-hmm. grab it, it's gonna be some t-shirts are stronger than others. Sure. Yes, sure. But like you talked about, like double, like looping it, kind of pulling it off. And yeah, pulling it off, looping it. Yeah. I was like that. I would have not really thought of that initially. You know, yeah. from, because it's not exactly the same as. As a you know, a traditional gi, obviously the key's pretty thick and, mm-hmm. and sturdy, but I was like, that's that's really kind of it's almost like setting up a Bravo choke with the exactly. or a Bravo grip because 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 when you bunch the t-shirt up on the back, it almost gives you a strap across the back. Yeah. It reminds me of a Bravo grip, you know, where you pull the lapel back. Yeah. It's kind of like that with the t-shirt. You just bunch it up and there you well, go. It's a you... great control too. If you're mm-hmm. like on, say, you fall on your back and somebody gets on top of you, yeah. you're just grabbing that and, and keep pinning them down. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. I always, I feel like I learned something from doing it. I know it's always fun and we don't really go in that, but I'm like, certain things you realize are really, really dangerous. Yeah. Like if you ever get in an altercation, like do like certain things you, you need to pay attention yeah. to. You notice that another sort of side benefit of it is, and, and I've, I've noticed this too, like whenever you do weird stuff like uh, with jiu-jitsu, you bring awareness to certain things. Like, so for instance, let's say if we, um, if we do a class where I say, all right, person A is going to go for ankle locks, person B is going to go for kimuras, okay? If you're person B and you know your partner's going for an ankle lock, you're going to be way more aware of your ankles, your mm-hmm. legs, right? So you bring awareness to that body. You understand how to, to block that um, or you, you understand to, to be mindful of that. Right. And same thing with like since we're ripping clothing up, a lot of times guys bring awareness to like certain parts of their clothing. So when person's grabbing stuff, they fight those grips off because they don't want to get their clothing ripped. Sure. And so it's one of those things where it's kind of a fun game to do that because, again, when you learn how to do this, it, it can be used strategically in competitions or rolling where, like, for instance, with you, you got good collar chokes. If I'm rolling with you, I'm more conscious of where your hands are around my neck. If I'm rolling with Adam, I'm always conscious of where his hands are grabbing my knees because yep. he's got the good double knee pass. If I'm rolling with uh, Chad, I'm always conscious of where my arms are because he might triangle choke me. So you learn how to bring awareness to certain parts of your body, right. and if you understand what that person's going for, it can be very beneficial. So again, it can be just another game that will have beneficial like implications down the road. Um, you know, through the awareness, just being aware of like where that person's grabbing because you just don't want them to rip your clothes off. You know, so another little side benefit to it. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think that we've had some people on the podcast too, and not and some people have not trained in the gi at all. Yeah, I think that's I I, I think you have to train in everything. I just think it makes you better at. at um, Better jiu-jitsu. I, you know, I think that for that, I mean, I don't think you have to, but I would say try it. You know, th- th- this is my thing. It's like, it's almost like a kid that says, uh, I don't want broccoli. You ever had yeah. it? No, I don't like broccoli. Yeah. You know, because I know that like when I first got into jiu-jitsu, I was like, I, fr- I don't want to wear this stupid gi. I didn't want to wear the damn thing, right? Because I was a wrestler. I wanted to do competitions. I don't want to wear the damn right. gi. But my coach made me. And it was fun because I kind of I kind of enjoyed it. I kind of began to like it a little bit, you know? And Again, you know, when you go to competitions, a lot of times they have both. And again, it's, you do whatever you want to do. I'm not saying anybody needs to do something. All I'm saying is give things a fair shake. And if you're going to like wear the gi or, if you, or even the people that do no gi, or excuse me, the people that do gi and they don't want to do no gi because they're like, right. I don't have a lapel. Fuck the lapel. Like, just roll. Just try it. O- be open-minded towards it, right? Because, I mean, again, they're not that different. And I think that they have transferable benefits to one another, right? Like, I think that the gi, it, it makes you have to set things up a little bit more effectively. Because sometimes like, in no gi, you can get away with being a little bit slippery or sliding out, right? This just this is one example. This is not that, not all. But then if you, and so if you can learn to set up better frames and have more precise techniques because you have to with the gi, because if you don't, some guy will just hang onto a shoulder or something, right? Right. When you go over to Nogi, you will have better framework, better like positioning for those things. And, and again, it's only going to be more effective now that we've taken the grips off, the handles off. In Nogi, you have to learn how to use just your body, just overhooks, underhooks, chest pressure, toes, everything else to push down on someone's body to keep pressure or to, to hold them in place. So then when you go into the Gi, you do those same things, but now you have handles. And right. it's only going to make that better. So you're not dependent upon the gi or the no gi, but they can benefit one another. You know, um, uh, they can support one another. Yeah, I think people, some people like no gi because it's faster, mm-hmm. and it might be more appealing from um, like a tournament standpoint sure. or a marketing standpoint. 
you know, because some of the biggest, you know, you do have some tournaments, you know, like the the Worlds and things like that, but you do have a lot of, you know, the EBI mm-hmm. and the, you know, the Quintet and all these big tournaments that are coming up. They're all no-gi. Mm-hmm. And um, I think maybe it's a little more exciting, more appealing to uh, the viewer. Sure. Um, but then I think the gi, some people see it as tradition. Yeah. So, like, as far as, and I don't doesn't necessarily agree with that. I think it, it's rooted in, you know, sure, jiu-jitsu yeah, yeah. and the start of jiu-jitsu, but I don't think it's necessarily, I, I don't know, I just feel like, you know, the way the jiu-jitsu has been progressing over the years, mm-hmm. a lot more ankle locks, a lot more yeah. no-gi, and a lot more, because some of the things you can't do, you know, in a gi. You're, By the so, rules. Yeah, See, illegal. The rule set's the big thing. <clears throat> That's the biggest problem. Right, like if you want gi to be it be exciting, it can be very exciting. I mean, you like you like go go watch some. There, there's beautiful, exciting gi matches. Go watch a, you know, like one of my favorite matches of all time. Go watch Buchecha versus Rodolfo Vieira, like 2013. Bro, bro, that's yeah. such an exciting match, right? But all all of them were exciting that year, right? They went against each other multiple times because they were both going right. So what you've got to do is you've got to set the rules so they make people go. Right, so you can say, listen, um, you know, if you start getting tangled up in some like lapel thing and you don't do anything, break it. You know, if you get tangled up in fifty-fifty and you're, in, in, you know, allow hill hooks. You know, or if you're not going to allow hill hooks, if they're stuck in fifty-fifty, like playing teeter totter back, break it, break the action, restart. Right, I mean, this is like if you look at judo, right? Judo. I mean, I'm not saying I don't want to go to judo. I don't want to be like that. But you look at judo; they want to encourage the throw. So if it hits the ground and there's no action, boom, stand back up. We're going to get you back where we want you. So you could easily say, like, eh, you know what? If every time that you guys get stuck in a situation where you're basically just hanging onto a lapel between someone's nuts and you're just not doing anything, oh, restart back and guard. Right? Just restart. We're just not doing anything. You guys are hanging out here for a minute and you're not doing anything. Let's keep it moving. You know, like, again, but a lot of times there are no stalling calls. There's nothing like that. And, you know, in, like, big tournaments, you'll have 10 minutes. 10 minutes is a long time, bro. Like mm-hmm. to me it's like you, the Olympic Olympic wrestling's not 10 minutes. Why do we need 10 minutes? You know, people say, "Oh, we need more time to set up for submissions." And they don't. Just go. Right? There's plenty of there's plenty of good tournaments that do 6 7 minutes and they're exciting matches, right? Just tell people, "You got this much time, you're going to go." And then you take you do some sort of things with the rules where you adjust them to where they can't sit there and stall. So you think about what are the biggest stalling grips or stalling positions we run into, and then you put limitations on those. It's, it's very simple, right? It's, but, you know, no one does it, but it's very simple because, you know, again, people don't want to take things away from jiu-jitsu. But, like, you know, a, a great example is, like, 50-50 in, in gi. If you're gonna If you're going to do that, allow heel hooks. If you're not going to allow heel hooks, have some break, like 30 seconds in the position, 20 seconds in the position. If we don't see any action, boom, just break off. Because you see these these... You'll see sometimes where you'll have these. Uh, what was it? A great example of it. Uh, was it uh, Bucha? Was it Buchecha in like uh, Urbeth or something? Where at one point he's just like sitting there laying there because they got stuck in the fifty yeah, fifty. Yeah. But they're in this thing where if one of them like comes up in this position, then it's like an advantage. And another person gets points. So he's just sitting there, and you, you just have to sit. You know what I mean? Like so. I, to me, they should be like, no, let's break. Let's get out of this position. You know what I mean? And I think that you could say, listen, with certain grips that can really stall the game out, like lapels and stuff like that, where they can strap it through the leg and. It just brings the, the the training or the the competition down to a halt. Say no, we're going to break that. You have if you get that grip, you've got X amount of seconds to make something happen. Like in judo, sometimes they'll have that. Like where if you back in the day, they'd say if you had certain grips, you have to move with them. If you don't, you get called for stalling. Mm-hmm. Right. So go do something. You know what I mean? I think that you could set those rules in place and, and create action and keep the matches shorter. Instead of having these long matches where guys have to basically they play possum for the first half and then they go hard for the next half, right? Mm-hmm. Like they kind of screw around for the first half and then they go. I mean, guys, you see it all the time. Yeah. Some guys go right out of the gate, but the thing is, is if you have a long match, a ten minute match is a long match, and if you go out, if you have two guys going full tilt with each other, a lot of times someone's going to end up, you know, at the end with uh, with their gas tank expended. So a lot of guys they don't want to go that. They want to like take their time, ease into it. But you take any professional jujitsu practitioner, six seven minute match, they can go full throttle for the whole time. And then you say, let's let's implement some rules so they can't get tangled up too much. Or if they do get tangled up, there's going to be a limited time in those positions. And this way we can keep the action going. I think you could have really exciting matches in the gi because it wouldn't be so slow. But again, when you have people that where you can get in these weird positions and you just get guys that sit and do nothing, I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna get what you get. Right. So, the, but the rules have to spur the action. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think some a lot of people, you know, that that come in and, and do a lot of leg locks, they just they, they don't like the gi because they feel like it limits them. Obviously, you're limiting what you can't do because of the rules. 
Right. Again, because because right. you, there's no one. You can still do every one of those leg locks in the gi, but right. because of the rules, they're not allowed to. Right. So it's, it's like harder to get out of certain things. I guess. Sure. I guess. You know. I mean. I guess friction, and you can get because you can get those pants tangled up and everything else. Do you think the like the rule sets in the gi in general? I mean, it's so steeped in tradition that you know some people kind of veer away from tradition. It's just like we were talking about, you know, uniforms. Like mm. people get your geese and stuff, yeah, yeah. right? Let's talk about that. Okay. So people get your geese and they get them and they're like either different color, like there's a gray and black gray one, and, black, yeah. and which is not, you know, you even had an issue at a, at a small yeah, tournament. Yeah, I went to a regional tournament. A regional yeah. tournament where somebody made you change your geese because it was the wrong color. Then you had a blue geese that wasn't the right blue or something like that. Right. Um, like what do you feel about like schools even implementing stuff? strict uniforms like why do they do that and why do you think it's good or bad yeah strict uniforms so are we talking about colors let's just talk about colors or having to have certain um a certain gi okay Okay. like a certain uh gi that is sold by that place or or whatever so i I think there's you probably a couple and again i don't know because this is not my mindset right i don't like this you know, for me, jujitsu is such an art form. I like. I want all the students to have this space where they can come in and create, right? To me, that it really is. It's like it's an art form, and it's like, you know, we we don't have canvas, we don't have paint, but we have movement, and our movement across the tatami. That's our brush strokes across the canvas, right? And that's our art as we we do it. And it's still the same thing. I mean, like you know, the person develops their ability to manipulate their hand in a certain way. We will learn how to manipulate our body in a certain way to create our art, right? I mean, to me, it's beautiful. When you, when you see beautiful jiu-jitsu done, you know, I've heard it say before, said it before, it's poetry in motion, right? You're seeing, right. you're seeing things moving. You're like, you can just, you can see the skill that was required to develop that or, or to execute those techniques. Now, that said, I don't know why people do certain things. Like, to me, like instituting like hardcore traditional, like you can only wear white geese. I guess it's some tradition that was set. My thing is, is I don't understand, other than a like control mechanism over the students, where you say, "Listen, I'm going to institute little things, little, little." Con- I mean, this is this is like more like psychological stuff, right? Like, if I can get you to do a lot of little stuff along the way, then I can get you to do bigger stuff later on, right? So if I can say, "Hey, listen, you've got to only wear white geese, and you got to wear this, and you got to do this, and you got to do that." Well, then I'm like, "Hey, I need. We got this big camp coming up. You got to pay this much money." Boom. You know, bigger. I can I can get you to do those things because you're already falling in line with all the little control things I'm doing, right? Um, so if it's not that, if it's just the tradition, people are just holding on to a, a white gi tradition. Whatever. Like I don't know. I don't get it. Like why? Like what's the point? I could understand maybe if you have like white mats and you don't want people to get like st- right. like stain them. That makes sense. But there, I don't see if any like a utility utility uh, utilitarian reason for them to say no. I don't want them to wear any like color besides white other than like some person said so at some point and that's the way it's supposed to be now as far as like i have a friend who trains at a a gym i'm not going to say his name but this has happened multiple times but a friend of mine i saw him a while ago he was telling me that he's at this gym and the gym recently instituted a rule where they no longer allow any other gi brand but their own so they have their own gi made and you have to buy that gi and it's something where it really he's so pissed about it Right, like he's so irritated that he has to buy this key because one, it doesn't fit him very well. The cut of it doesn't fit him very well. It's kind of expensive, and he's like, I gotta buy all new geese. So these like five geese that I have no longer I can wear. Right, he's irritated by the whole situation. And again, to me, it's like you're. To me, when you run a gym business, a jujitsu business, I've seen this happen in some associations where it's like some bean counter gets in and some business consultant or some shit, right? They come in and, you know, again, I've, I've actually heard guys talk about this in martial arts business and it kind of makes me sick. Um, but they'll say like, we have a customer and this customer, they're not even a member, they call them customers, right? Your customer comes in to this gym and they're going to be there for X amount of months, right? That's their average lifespan of that person in your side of your business. So how can we increase you know, the, the lifetime value of that customer, right? Well, we can make them buy this stuff and we make them buy this stuff and they can only do, 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 do and you just list this stuff, right? And it's one thing if they, they voluntarily want your stuff, that's cool, right? Like I like in my gym, I sell my geese. I don't enforce them. If you want one, get you one. Right. If you don't want them, I don't care. But they're there if you want them. But if you start enforcing it, you're basically just you're just squeezing out. Now, if you have to do what you got to do to keep the, the lights up, that's fine. I just think there's a better way to do it. And to me, it's like there's a line that you can straddle where you can say, I really want to help these guys out. I want to do good by this community that I have, right? These people that I'm building up, right? I really want to do, do well by these people. But I also have to run a business. 
you know, and then you, you stay somewhere in the middle there, straddle that line. So this way you're making sure you keep the lights on and doing well by yourself. Because again, if you're worried about keeping the lights on or if you're worried about where you're going to get your next meal, you really can't serve the people in, inside your gym as, as well. Yeah. But at the same time, you say, listen, everything that I do, if I'm going to ask you know, of something, I have to make sure that they're, I'm giving something in a return. So instead of being like, take, 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 like, okay, let me make sure that I'm giving someone something of value to them, and then I can ask for this in return. And we, we keep this reciprocal relationship going instead of being like, you know, because again, if, you're, if your base doesn't want that gee that you're trying to push on them, you're only going to destroy the community. You're only going to create ill will, to, you know, towards you. And like this guy that I was talking about, I trained with him and several of his friends, and they were all irritated by it. They were all like, "I was like, how's everything going, man?" Eh. Because they said it was a lot of that stuff. It wasn't just the gee. It was all these little things where they're just getting pecked away, and it's just like a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there. And before they know it, they're just like, "I feel like I've become more of a dollar sign rather than a member of a gym." Mm. And uh, so again, I think that sometimes you have this this issue where guys just trying to squeeze out as much as they can. You know, like I've even seen some associations recently where all of a sudden the gyms have to replace all their mats with one particular company and they've got to do all this different stuff and it's just more money out of these people's hands. And I'll ask, I'll like, you know, I asked the a buddy of mine, I said, like, well, are they like helping you run your business? Are they helping you set up like, you know, good like websites for advertisements so that you can bring more members in? Are they helping you with like coaching and planning and, and running them? Are they helping you with anything to make more money on the end so this way you can keep their whole reciprocal thing going, right? No. It's just like gimme, gimme, gimme. Right, so you have to say like, well, if we're going to offer, if we're going to take, we need to offer, and it's the same thing. It works like that. So you would say like, okay, we have an association. The association head should be saying, here's what I'm going to give you. Here's what you guys give in return, just like the students. And then that gym owner, that gym coach, he says, hey guys, here's what I'm offering, and then here's what you do, and then we go back and forth and reciprocate with one another. Right, I give you 100 percent, you give me 100 percent, we'll just keep going. You know, and, and I think that sometimes that gets lost. You know, people, yeah, they they uh, they lose their way a little bit. Do you think um, maybe building, like say everybody has the same gi on, mm. it, it's building like a continuity, like um, everybody's kind of dressed the same, so you're kind of mm -hmm. part of the same team, gives it like a, collective could nature. that give you, yeah, like a collectiveness of like a, your one yeah. collective body, one collective group? Maybe, you think, I maybe, mean, you but think I, any advantage of that? Maybe, but I don't like that. I'm very, yeah. I'm very individualistic, right? Because I think again, we're each our own individual entity on the mat, and I want everybody to be able to express themselves. Because again, to me, it's it, it jujitsu. It's a singular sport. It's an expression of self. And I want everybody to be able to go in their own direction, follow the music as they see fit, and go wherever it takes them, mm -hmm. instead of being pushed into. Because I've been to gyms again where everybody's wearing the same gi. You go in and it's like you you roll with someone, and it's everybody does the same moves. Like it's like they're like they're they're on this curriculum, and it's all the same stuff. If you roll with one person, you've rolled with all of them, right? It's like you're rolling with little robots. Robots wearing white gis and rolling the exact same way. It's like <laughs> wow, this is weird. Where if I go to a gym that I think is a little bit better off, where you go in and like. Every person you roll with is slightly different, sometimes radically different, right? They have different games. You know, I mean, like Chad and Chad and myself are a great example. Two, two, we've trained with we trained with each other for over a decade. I mean, come, I mean, there's there's threads of our games in one another, but completely different games, right? Right? Not even close to the same. If you roll with this, like, it, it, you, it's not even remotely the same, right? And to me, that's a good sign of a gym because that means like everybody's going their own way, and they're going to be able to express themselves in the way that's going to be work best for them, and then they can develop those moves and bring them back to the core, right? So again, they go out, they go out on their own journey of their own self. And they come back and say, hey, guys, I developed something. Like for you, if I would have stifled your ability to do some of the things that you do, right, because they're not part of my game, right, then that would have been a problem. And I think that, again, that's maybe not where we're kind of getting off topic here. But, again, I think that the the collective nature of the the wearing the white geese and everybody wearing the same I think that's kind of, I don't think it's necessary. Right. Because we're still part of a team. We're just wearing our own little, our own armor that we like, right? And I want, I want to wear what I want to wear, right, instead of, like, having to wear this one thing all the time I just don't and I've even seen and a lot of guys I've seen that train at those places like <laughs> I sold the gi went to one guy um, online and he uh, he says that uh, he couldn't wear the gi it was only right. a, it was a blue gi but he says Jim didn't allow blue gis and I said well man why'd you get it he's like well I'm gonna wear it if I go if I travel it'll be my travel gi and I was like that's so weird that you have a gi that you can't wear unless you travel because they don't allow blue gis hmm. so strange to me you know I'm like because again it's just like why not yeah I, I do agree with you for the most part though like I mean Everybody's got a different style, and and sometimes when you buy a gi, you feel kind of like, oh, I like the way this yeah. feels, and it's like a good fit. And so you well, know, you you enjoy wearing. Sometimes you enjoy wearing gis, and yeah. and I think that 
same thing with Noki stuff. People mm-hmm. like you know rash guards that fit a certain way or shorts and and I think overall it it, it is kind of what you're you know th- those are just additions or variables right. to jujitsu. And I think as long as you're doing jujitsu, uh, you know who cares. Honestly, like you said, who cares if you do gi yeah. or only gi? You've never right. done no gi. I think that's true. You know, for me, I like to taste everything a little mm-hmm. bit, try to, you know, see what I like. Um, but, you know, when you, I think when you have athletes that are like, that find that they excel at one aspect, they're sure. going to stick to that. Cause sure. This is, this is their time to excel and be the best at this. Right. And sometimes dabbling in a bunch of different things could, could really lead you off the, I mean, I guess it could have an effect of helping the things grow together or it could maybe just stifle progress. Well, and and again, I'm not saying by any means, just to sort of throw this out there, I'm not saying I'm right about any, this is not about right and wrong. This is all about perception and and just the way that I like to do it. You know, so I just like to be a little bit more open-ended and free-natured about it because again, I, I, it's, I've seen the, like I've, I've trained with people before who were closed-minded, and I saw the repercussions of that, both in their game and the way that the community re- responded. And I knew I didn't like it, so I didn't want to be under the. I didn't want to be over top of people. I didn't want to keep people under my thumb. I wanted them to be able to express themselves, right? And, and again, to, that that starts in, in a number of different ways, right? Um, so you know, that's uh, that's my thought on that. Yeah, I, I you know I think the main point we're getting at is as long as you're doing jujitsu. That, that's the important part. Yeah, you're doing jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and, and, and again, when we were talking about the gi and the no gi, I don't care what people want to do. If they want, if they want to do gi or if they want to do no gi only, whatever, that's fine. The one thing that I'll say though is that if you decide to do this one thing, let it be yours instead of telling other people that they don't need to do the other thing. That's yeah. the thing that I see that that's really strange to me because you know, for for instance, I'll have some like I'll have some like blue belt, right? That'll tell me, oh, gi's stupid. I'm like, <laughs> you're a blue belt. It's like I've been trained for 15 years, bro. It's like I've I've put in so much time to this thing, both in gi and no gi. I've chosen that I like doing this thing, and I can see the value in it, right? I I've been through the superficial beginnings, right? I I can see the the deeper value to some of this stuff. So I'm not saying you got to do it, but I'm telling you there's something there that you you don't see yet because you haven't put in that time. Because when you train jujitsu, there's all the superficial stuff, there's all that basic stuff you put in. But when you start to put in, you're getting past that ten year mark. You start to go down these these different. I can't quite explain it, but there's a different type of knowledge you get from it, right? Like it's it's something different, and you start to get these deeper lessons of what you're doing and some of these techniques. And again, there are deeper lessons than just the gripping and stuff to the gi, right. just the you know the overhooking and speed of the no gi. There's lessons to be learned there. So people can say like, oh, they're stupid or whatever. But that's fine, but you know, keep that to yourself. Let other people do what they want to do. Let them follow their music. Right again, you know they hear the they hear the music. Let them follow it instead of having someone tell them it's stupid or whatever. Because it's funny, I've had a guy come in before. I've actually had had several that came in and started training. And when they first started training, they were like, they came up to me and said, "Hey man, listen, do, do I have to do the gi?" And I'm like, "You don't have to do anything." I was like, "You're paying to be here." So I was like, "I mean, I'll tell you how it's going to work if you don't do it, but you can do whatever you want to do, right?" And uh, they're like, "Cool," because you know I just I don't want to do the gi. And this is someone that's like been training for like a week. Right, and they're telling me they don't want to do it. There's like I just don't see the, the the validity or the utility. I'm like that's cool, man. Like you, you're you're you know. I in my head I'm thinking like you're an expert. You've been you 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 will read some stuff online, right? And what it is is they're taking other people's opinions, right? They haven't formulated their own. They're being commentators, right? And that's that, that's the biggest thing. The biggest thing is like if you want to make a commentary on the the validity of the gi or why or why not, go wear it for ten years and then tell me. Right, like Eddie Bravo wore that damn gi for ten years, right? right. Or whatever it was. I remember like meeting him back in like Tennessee in like two thousand four, I think it was. He was doing a seminar in Tennessee, and he was like, "Man, I wore that gi for X amount of years. I was just, I, mean, I don't want to wear it again." That's cool. That dude put the time in. He can say, "Man, I don't want to wear it." Good, you put the time in. But I think for a lot of people, go experience for yourself. Put a couple of years in that gi. See what you think about it before you decide to take someone else's opinion. Because here's what would happen: these guys would wear the, they would do no gi, and then one day. They would like just come over to a gi class. Maybe they screwed up on the schedule. I had one of them in particular. He was an older guy. He came up to me. He's like, man, that was fun talking about the gi. I was like, yeah, it wasn't so bad. He goes, no, man, that was a lot of fun. I want to do it again. Bought himself a gi and started training the gi. But again, he originally came into it with this mindset of I listened to this guy talk about it online and this guy online, this guy online. And when I'm getting into it, I don't want to wear the gi. And I, you know, I just urge people, you know, with your opinions, allow them to, you know, be be yours. Allow people to make their own. But if you're going to make a decision, take people's information in for sure. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, make your own experience, 
right? Because it's your life. You should make your own experiences about the things that you're going to get into. You know, especially if you're going to get into jiu-jitsu, you know, you, it's your art form. You're going to be your, your own style. Everything's going to develop if you do it for long enough. Right. Go experience on your own before you decide to write something off. Yeah. And it's, again, like you said, it's your journey. It's mm-hmm. your, if you want to only know gi or only gi. Rock it out. That's you. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's what you choose. And that uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's just, you know. Because that's just the way it is. Nothing it's wrong. Nothing wrong with you know doing no only no gi or guys that only want to do leg locks or no. You know or, that's what makes it so much fun. You know, it's like uh, you know if 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 you went to the uh, the ice cream store and all they had was vanilla, you would you know I mean I really like vanilla. I'll go get ice cream. I'll actually get <laughs> I'll get some vanilla ice cream. What does that say about you as a person? It says I'm bland as shit. No, but but vanilla's good, man. Uh, you get a good vanilla. Comfy, comfy gal's got a good vanilla. But uh, you go get a good vanilla, right? But someday you might be like, man, I kind of like something else. Right. Right? They're, they're, they've got a whole myriad of flavors. Sure. And jiu-jitsu is the same way. It's like, okay, well, we've, we've got this thing where, yeah, like some gyms focus on this, some gyms focus on this, on this. But you get this myriad of different opportunities and, and ways to train and everything else. And that's beautiful. I like that. That's one of the reasons why when people say, hey, would you like it to be an Olympic sport? I'm like, no. Because, like, if it's an Olympic sport, then we're going to have to, like, be molded by that. Yeah. Right? Like, the cool thing about right now with jiu-jitsu is that it's it's unregulated to a degree where basically you've got all these different tournaments doing all these different rule sets. And it's really cool because you yep. get to see all these different expressions of jiu-jitsu. If we were to become an Olympic sport, then all of a sudden, you're going to be this one unifying body that tells you this is how it's done. And most places, again, they, they will start to morph to those rules. And I don't like that. Yeah. You know, I think I like the freeform nature of it where we can just express. We can just go this way and that way and kind of play around with it. I, I, I like that idea because, again, I wouldn't want to be something like in judo, for instance. They used to be able to grip certain ways. They used to be able to attack legs. Now they can't. You know, they, they get all these rules and, and restrictions put on them. And I think eventually restrictions and rules can help create action sometimes. But I think at some point it become really restrictive of the, of the actual style and the expression because then you start saying, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then just because we want to see this one thing. You know, and then it's like all of a sudden where you could do that in jiu-jitsu where it's like all of a sudden they restrict certain things to where you, you don't even want to do this because they're taking away your whole game or they're, right. ne- you know, giving, um, they're hurting your game the way that you would play in a competition. So right. I just think it's... It, yeah, I think you're um, getting that some guys that are like against the IBJJF. There are some sure. guys are like that. Right. But I also think... But they um, can compete elsewhere because there's exactly. plenty of other tournaments. <laughs> and uh, also... The IBJJF, the IBJJF is not the end-all be-all. It's just one brand right. of tournament. You can go anywhere else and compete, and it's not a big deal. Right. I do like, uh, you know, the idea of only focusing on one, though, and just because you kind of go deeper down the rabbit hole. What do you mean? Like, say you do just no gi, mm. and that's what you specialize in. Yeah. And you've never done gi. Mm-hmm. And that's all you do. So you think about how much you take this little, like John Donner taking like the leg lock game and extrapolating it, mm-hmm. know, and doing figure out figuring out all these, you know, small nuances and things. So you're kind of allowing people because they're spending more time at one aspect of jujitsu mm-hmm. to get maybe even get deeper and create new things. Like, mm-hmm. like Eddie Bravo, for example. Sure. You know, I mean, his whole system it's completely different. A lot of things are completely different. Sure. The rubber guard is, you know, nobody saw that shit before. I mean, it was around. What was what was it like? Was it called some kind of wrestling? No, it wasn't like a wrestling. Well, the type. wrestling was the those were the twister. The twister. So it's right. called, in right. wrestling, called a guillotine. Yeah. I mean, it's all jujitsu, man. Like, I mean, like right. so, someone asked me, like, I, I went and trained at Ten Point at, uh, in Lombard, uh, which right outside of Chicago, and someone was like, "How was it training at Tenth Planet?" Mm-hmm. I'm like, "We rolled." Yeah. It was jujitsu. Yeah. Right? Like, it's all the same. It's like you have these different variations of stuff, but it's all jujitsu. You know, it's like, I mean, it's it's not that different. Like, you can try to, like, make it cool with names and stuff like that, but when you boil down to it, man, it's all grappling. Right. Right? Shit. I mean, even you get into, like, other sports like sambo, wrestling, you know, whatever. It's all grappling. Different rules, different focuses. It's all grappling. Right. You know, so, I, you know, to me, like, I try to be open-minded. You know, he's so like, I don't, I don't give a crap about any of it. Like, I remember there was a guy one time he came into our gym to buy some mats from a friend of mine who uh, we had these mats uh, in storage, and we were my buddy was selling them. He bought them at an auction. He tenth planet guy. He comes in, and he has a hoodie on, and he has a tenth planet shirt under it. And he looks around, and he zips up his shirt. And he goes, looks at me, he goes, Yeah, man, gotta zip up my hoodie. And I looked at him, and I didn't know what he meant. I was like, What do you mean? And he says, he zips it back down, opens up, you know, pulls the uh, hoodie open to, to reveal this 10th planet emblem in the center of his chest. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, 10th planet, 
And I look at him, I'm like, I don't understand. He's like, well, you know, a lot of jiu-jitsu guys hate on us. I'm like, man, I'm a white dude in Kentucky. I don't give a shit about, you know, 10 planets, all jiu-jitsu to me. Right. You know what I mean? And, and to, to me, like, when you roll it, it's not that much different. There's some different variations. And it would be no different if you, because, like, for instance, I rolled and I was rolling with this guy named Omar. And I, all of a sudden, I could feel him going for that rubber guard. I felt his ankle up by my ear. Yeah. And I was like, ooh. I, like, you're, I was like, you're playing that rubber guard, right? Don't play a lot of that. But it would be no different than if I went down to someone's gym and they were playing a lot of, like, you know, knee shield or inverted stuff, right? Like, oh, there's a different style here. You know, it's just a different type of technique. I do I do like the – I really like the 10th planet style. I think it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I try to, you know, implement some of it. I'm probably pretty terrible at it. But um, I've, I've always, you know, I've got some Eddie Bravo's books and I've – I kind of like I like watching because some of the setups. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're yeah. just, they just they just look very effective, yeah. you know. And and I enjoy watching. And a lot of these guys that we had, you know, the guy on the podcast that uh, John. Yeah, he's you know he's he he won every single one of his matches different way. And I was mm-hmm. like, that's insane. Like right. how he's super well rounded. It was it, it was nice, and his mentality was kind of cool too. You know, yeah. just get after it kind of thing. It was yeah. Cool. The one thing I would say though is I think that sometimes people time away from the thing that you're chasing is good. Meaning, like, maybe you're a no-gi guy, but maybe you go do some, you do some gi. You might find that it might help mm-hmm. you. You get away from the thing that you're doing. Like, a lot of times, like, for instance, I'll have, like, epiphanies about jiu-jitsu. I'm in doing yoga, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, I, for instance, I was doing that hot yoga class. And that's where the little, the little, the little post came from because I was, like, thinking about it. I was like, man, I think about all those times where I was competing and I was training or I was like getting ready to go to the gym to do MMA training with some yeah. guys and I was nervous about it and then after the training session's over I'm like man I'm glad I did it you know I'm, I'm glad I conquered my own inner bitch right and you see it like from other places or you know there's times where I'll listen to like a history lecture and I'll have some epiphany about something else right some unrelated thing you know like the, there's no useless knowledge so even if you don't think that it's going to have value to you right now you don't know that you might do it and find it like a parallel for it or find another word a way to use it or maybe it makes you think in a new way um that you didn't think of before so you know i, I tell people a lot of times if you're hammering that one thing take some time away from it yeah maybe this could be the form of a different style of jiu-jitsu or grappling this could also be just taking time away from it period like right. go, go go lay in a hammock for an hour or two you know like let your body rest let your mind rest from the thing that you're trying to hammer in and a lot of times you'll have these you'll have things come to you from that you know, a lot of times that's my my big thing is I'll like take time away from something if if it's frustrating me or if I don't feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing or even if I'm, if I'm just working really hard everything's humming along I try to keep myself I pull back a little bit this way I don't like empty out my cup completely you know mm-hmm. leave a little bit in there so that you know I have enough for, for the next day and the sure. next day you sure. know all right man whoo we want to change it there for a minute yeah man I, I just drank uh, some coffee so that was awesome let's yeah. do some q a let's do some q a so guys Ooh. if you're listening let's do some q a we uh, we just got done rambling. Man, we, yeah it was awesome what uh we've been going here for an hour an hour wow hour uh somebody said ask in the ufc let's talk about that real quick okay how well do you think he would do i think he'd do well ask him he's a, he's, he's a monster you think he could beat tyron woodley man i don't know I mean, like, I, I just don't know. I mean, like, he, maybe he could, but, I mean, Tyron Woodley's a monster. And I don't know why, but why does, like, I, you know, I don't follow MMA as much as I used to. Right. But why does everyone, like, because, like, to me, it's like, I'll watch these events, and these people are kind of downplaying Tyron Woodley. I'm like, that dude's an animal. Yeah. Right? Like, like, they'll be like, oh, he, like, <laughs> like he doesn't get, and I, to me, he doesn't get enough respect sometimes, because that dude's a freak of nature, and he's really good, and he's been training for a long time, and you see he's, he's made his way up. It's like, dude, that dude's a monster. But, like, sometimes he gets kind of downplayed a little bit, yeah. you know? And I think it's maybe because he's playing a lot smarter now, maybe. You know, I don't know. But, like, you know, I was watching one thing where, like, I, I was watching the event, and he was still the champion. And, you know, most of the time when the guy's the champion, they built the guy up. They're like, he's the champion, blah, 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 right. you know? But instead, they were kind of, like, they kind of brushed him off a little bit, and they were, like, putting more focus on the challenger. I'm like, what do you guys do? You have a champion. Build this I dude up. I think it's his, his relationship. I think he, he's just, he doesn't give a shit about his relationship with the management or people. Because he, he's going to do what he wants, what, what he needs to do to win. Uh-huh. Whether it's, you know, fighting Wonder Boy and being really calculated, not yeah. overcommitting. And it ends being up being, smart. to a lot of people, ends up being a quote-unquote boring fight. To him, you know, it's like, hey, this is my livelihood and I don't want to get knocked out. This is my livelihood. This is my health. 
going right. out there right. being stupid and like throwing punches sure. and getting getting into wars all the time. Yeah, you're gonna have a short he's career. He's smart, dude, and he yeah. still does commentary and yeah. like analysis. He's super smart. He's smart. He's he's so. a freaking monster. Like the guy, he, he, like I, I watch those events. I'm like, why are they not building this guy up? Like he's awesome. I mean, dude, just like you have this this ball of muscle that you could. I mean, like George St. Pierre did the same thing a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like he would he he always had good fights, but some of those fights, like he would just kind of like do what he needed to do to win and not he get himself. Said he did that. Yeah, which I mean, it's smart, man. Like. Again, you know, his fighting's a, a nasty thing, and you know, people don't think about it, dude. But even like one of those fights where they look like they didn't take much damage, you come out of those fights, bro, and you're beat up. Like I was talking to someone about that recently, where, you know, I remember I'd have like a a, a fight that ended in the first round, and I didn't take it didn't look like I took much damage, and then the next morning I'd be like, oh my god, like my whole body was beat up, and I'd have like my ankle was twisted, and my right. friggin' hand hurt. I mean, all kinds of weird problems because it's a fight, man, and it's like this. It's another experience. So, uh, go ahead. Okay. I'm just saying I'm, I'm going to keep good. going. <laughs> good. Uh, we did talk about this earlier. Askren versus Khabib would be cool is what they said. Yeah. Uh, I, I, but I thought Askren. They're different. They're different yeah, ways. Askren's a 170 pounder. So. Well, I think Khabib could come up. He could. I mean, he cuts like a, a ton of weight anyway, I think, right? Honestly, I think Khabib probably has better stand-up. I could see that. I, and, I, well, the other thing, he's more active. He's been way more active. Well, I mean, well, well, if, if, if Askren came in right now with with no fights or yeah. two-no fights or stuff like that and just came over and fought... Uh, could be. I think it would be bad. Jitters, you know? man. They talk about the jitters. Well, the that jitters and, have something to do with it. Well, jitters and just it's simply just it, you know it's uh there's uh you know there's something to you know in that kind of keeping that forward momentum when you compete where you uh you find your right rhythm in in you know just like you do in the in the jujitsu gym or like in a, in a fighting gym whatever it's like when in your sparring right you find that rhythm you go out into the fight and if you've been competing and fighting whatever on a consistent basis, you find your rhythm out there. Yeah. And then if you come back into the big show and all of a sudden, like, it's just like, you know, when you look at Connor, right? It's like, I mean, I'm sure he suffered from his last fight a little bit with coming out from two years or whatever it was. Yeah, like, sure. and all of a sudden you're going into the big fight against this, this friggin' tuned up, like nasty veteran who's just waiting for you. It's like the best style for you as well. Man. Yeah. Chewie, here's a great question, man. And this is, this could be a long one. Okay. It's from Lucifer sixty nine. Lucifer sixty five. How how to convince my parents to let me learn martial art? There is so much of that question, um, and, and you know I'll, I'll start off by saying that my parents were very against me doing jiu jitsu because mm-hmm. they're like I'm a physical therapist. Like what the hell are you doing jiu jitsu for? Like why do you need to do that? You're gonna hurt yourself. Yeah. It's not worth it. Same thing with, I still get it for competition. If I go want to compete, they're like, why the hell are you doing this? You're putting your health on the line. Man, I just, I think that if they've never done, you know, martial art or the feeling you get with jiu-jitsu or the sense of accomplishment or the sense of just having a better self. I mean, I don't know, you're just a better self. Yeah. That's what I think. I mean, what do you think, what would you say if it was your mom or whoever and she's like, and you're like, I want to go do jiu-jitsu. Well, I had to see that. I just actually... See, yeah, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say because you had to do for self-defense. No, right? no, no. Okay. So, so basically, so for me, like when I got into wrestling and jiu-jitsu and all fighting and all this stuff, like my mom was not supportive at all. Like, you know, when I got into jiu-jitsu, I was 18 years old. So you might be a little bit younger than me, and I'll come back to that in a second. But when I started, I was 18 years old. I paid for my classes, my driving, everything else. And, um, you know, I remember my mom was not a fan. She yeah. was like, why? She she did this with wrestling. She's like, why are you doing this? Right. She constantly asked me, why are you doing this? And I started doing jujitsu. And again, why are you doing this? You know, I have injuries. Come on, why are you doing this? And then I remember my first fight. I showed her my first MMA fight. I was so proud of it. And I bring it in, put it in the VHS tape. And she starts hitting me on the shoulder. She's like, God, you're so mean. What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? You know, that said, my mom was very supportive of me. She was not supportive of my activities. Meaning, she was like, I got your back. I'll always be here for you. But why can't you do something else? Right? Why can't you do something else? You know? And I don't think that she did it in a malicious na- or not a na- uh, malicious, but a like nature where she didn't want me to do things. It's man, you don't want your little boy to get hurt, right? You know, as parents, they have this 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 urge to want to shield their kid and protect their kid. But ultimately, again, you're hurting your kid if you try to shield him too much, right? Put him in that bubble. But with her, you know, she understood that enough about herself. So she was like, listen, I don't want you to do it because I'm afraid of you getting hurt, but you seem to want to do it. Go do it. The thing that I noticed was that in any of these, you know, whether and got and even the business, when I told when I came to my mom and said, hey, mom, I'm going to leave the gym or leave my, my job making pretty good money to do this gym stuff full time, make almost no money. She looked at me and she's like, all right, I support you. But why? Why are you doing that? You know, again, she just doesn't understand. But she always supported me. What I found was that 
over time when she realized it was something like legit. When I was out there doing it and I wasn't just quitting, she respected it. She didn't like it, but she respected it. And she was like, cool, like you're, it's not going away. You're going to keep doing this thing. I respect that. Um, and so she was there for me. Now, if you're young, meaning like, you know, like you can't drive, you can't work a job and pay for your own gym dues, whatever, it's a different situation. And in that situation, I think you need to identify what is it about martial arts and jujitsu that they don't like and then address that. And a lot of times it's going to be like, you know, it, to me, a lot of times it's going to come back down to like, they don't want you to get hurt. Right. right. And that's where you say like, hey, let's go do a class. Just come watch a class with me. You know, because a lot of times they'll offer a free class, you know, say, bring me to this class and let me show, let's just go check it out a little bit, you know, and let me see what's going on and let them watch what's going on. Um, and I think a lot of times, because I've had several parents come into our gym where their kid dragged the parents to the gym and the parents were not crazy about it. Yeah. And then their child did the class. And then afterwards, they were like, wow, this was awesome. This is great. Right. And, and again, sometimes for people when they get into jujitsu, you know, there's superficial things like being in shape, learning how to fight, all that stuff. But a lot of times when you start training, you find that there's some sort of inner satisfaction that you can't quite pinpoint at first yeah, that, sure. that brings you back in. That has nothing to do with getting in shape, has nothing to do with like self-defense. It has everything to do with something that's dragging you in there because you just want to be there for some reason. Right. So... <laughs> Take them to a class with you. Try it out. And identify what it is that they don't like about it. And again, if you're going to talk to your parents, understand that they're look, probably looking out for you. Talk to them. Ask them like what's bothering you and do your best to address those issues. Um, and, and you know, show respect to them. Right? Again, don't come out there and tell them what, you, what you're what you going to do. You show respect to your parents and, and make sure you understand that it's something you want to do. But ultimately, you need their support too. There's some good questions on here. Oh, are they? Man. Okay. Oh, here's here's one you've probably answered many times. All right. But let's keep it like one tip. One tip. One so, tip. Uh-oh. Hi, Chewy. This is from Crossy Saint. Hi, Chewy. I'm about to attend my first BJJ session next Monday. Mm -hmm. Any tips for my first time? Action. Just do it. I, it it's, it's, I've done videos on this already. There's nothing more simple than that. Like... Anytime you do something for the first time, you're going to be nervous, you're going to be scared, you're going to be anxious, not sure what to expect. Everyone does it. Me as a fighter of like years and doing jiu-jitsu for X amount of years when I first started doing yoga, like several years ago, the first night that I went into a, uh, a hot yoga studio with all these like women coming in there and they're like Lululemon and stuff. Man, I was I was nervous. Like I was nervous to go into a damn yoga studio just because it wasn't because I was afraid of getting beat up. It was just I didn't know what to expect. I was like, did I have the right clothes on? Did I have did I have enough water for the class? Are they is my yoga mat going to be okay? Like, yeah, all this dumb stuff. And then you get in there and it's like nobody cares. And if you go into a gym, like you're going to have all these questions and all these stupid nervousness stuff because your body's freaked out a little bit. But when you go in, they're going to greet you like they should. And they're going to say, hey, man, listen, come on in, train, whatever. You're going to have a good experience. And more than likely, you're going to leave the class going, this was amazing. I'm so glad I did it. And I'm so glad that even though I was, again, going back to where we are our own worst enemy, I'm glad that I didn't listen to myself when I was out in the car and I was thinking about driving away. I'm glad that I got back up, went to the gym, you know, and went through the damn thing. So just do it. Action. Awesome. Awesome. All right, you pick one out. All right, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I, I wasn't looking, so I was, I've been talking. There's one about sparring. I'm a little confused on the question. Okay. But, uh, it says, I feel like we do too much. Sp this is from The Omen 49. The Omen. Uh, I feel like we do too much sparring in jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. It's great to come in on the days that you feel like shit, but on those days, we should not be sparring at all. Skip the sparring. That's when you get hurt. I don't know if that was an answer to a question, but, you know, that, that's a that's kind of a, there's definitely, you know, for me, like that we talked about that earlier. I didn't feel well. Yeah, but I think showing up is is important. Um, but mm -hmm. again, you have to, you know, throttle how how hard you go, maybe, or if you you know just every, drill, or maybe flow roll something listen, like that. Everybody's <laughs> got to do their own thing. So like, should you be coming into the gym if you feel like absolute trash? Probably not always. But there are times where you need to learn how to push yourself. Again, this is this is not easy stuff that we're getting into. Now, there's times where you can back off a little bit and rest. But I know that there's been some of my best breakthrough moments in jiu-jitsu have come when I came in on a day where I felt like absolute right. dog crap. There was a, there was one in particular that will will never leave my memory where I was I didn't feel well. I felt weak. I didn't feel strong. I didn't feel energized. I didn't feel like going to training. I came to training that day, and I remember I get there, and we're going through the drills, and I'm just struggling to get through the drills and training and everything else. When it comes time to roll for sparring, I remember my first role was with a tough black belt who used to, we used to have battles. I was a brown belt at the time. And I told him before, jokingly, 
don't hurt me too much today, man. We start rolling, and I, I, for some reason, I don't know if it was because I relaxed. We used to have battles where we would fight, fight, fight like freaking pit bulls, right? That day, I just relaxed, and I was able to continuously sweep him from half guard. Wow. And he was like, he looked at me, and we literally rolled Thursday, and we were having battles, and he actually got the better of me on Thursday. Saturday, I'm able to sweep him over and over again, and he was he was like dumbfounded. He wouldn't let me roll with anybody else that day. He was like, what the hell just happened here? So I was trying to like grab other parties. like, no, no, we're rolling again. He's like, we're rolling until I pass your half guard. He never passed my half guard. But again, I would have never had that day if I would have been like, nah, I need to set out this. So again, you are right when your body, like when there's physical damage and things like that, you need to back off sometimes. But at the same time, you also have to learn what's in you. And there's a lot more in you than what you think there is. And I think it's one of the things that jiu-jitsu does have uh, to help you is to dig in a little deeper and find what you're truly made of sometimes. And I find that a lot of times there's more in you than this that you think there is. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see. There was one I saw earlier. Um, let's see. Where is it? I can't find it. Chris Simpson says he's uh, 300 pounds of pure muscle. Ooh. And uh, who wants to roll? He might be that guy. I've seen that meme coming around with like this like yeah. Juiced up like white belt. Yeah, the, down, like, down in bronze medal. Down in Brazil, yeah. So just he was so yoked. I was like, maybe that's maybe that's him. Here's one. Get get ready. Says Chu. What's your thoughts on BJJ uh, and I guess weed and tournaments? Uh, BJJ weed tournament event. I, yeah, they've got some of these like high roller. I think is what's called. It's like, yeah. uh, they basically smoke weed like before the matches. Or like, <laughs> I haven't seen them. It's uh, <laughs> funny. So. So I they mean, so they just they just get high and roll. Yeah, they get high and they just they compete. Whatever, I guess. whatever. I think it's more of a I guess relaxed environment. I haven't seen it. Whatever, man. Uh, I mean, whatever you want to do. I don't I don't really have a, a statement. I mean, like I I have no qualms against weed. We've had people in the gym that then that smoked. And oh yeah, trained and. Well, one of the guys, and again, I don't know much about it. He was telling me that like there's different ones that he would smoke. So I guess there's indigas and sativas, right? So indigas, I guess, make you relax, and the sativas make you do something, like they make you go. So he was like. When I want to relax, I use this one. When I want to go hard and do something, I want to do this one because he would come in like high as a kite, but he was a like rough roll. Yeah, you know, yeah. He, he wasn't. It wasn't like he was just hey, bro. Some people like, are like that. I think some yeah. people have like a, they feel like really focused. Some people get really relaxed. Yeah, the one thing. I mean, if I did it, like I'm so like, I'm so like a like type A with that type of stuff. Like yeah. as soon as it hits me, man, I just like, bleh. so I don't think I, I don't think it would benefit me personally. <coughs> um, um, let's see here. How do you approach sparring and rolling with a higher belt from another gym who is going harder and more seriously? Um, from Joe Diesel. You just roll, man. Like, I mean, again, it, I guess it depends on the situation. But if you have someone coming in your gym and they're rolling hard, then you just you go hard with them. You know what I mean? I mean, that's that's me. Like, a lot of times when people come in from other gyms, I'll kind of let them set the... Uh, the pace a little bit, right? So I'll kind of like, I'll just kind of see where they're at. So when we start rolling, I'll just kind of lock up with them, kind of get a feel for where they're they're at, where, where they're going to go with this thing. And then I just kind of follow them and we go. And if they go hard, I'll go hard. If they go a little bit lighter, I'll go a little bit lighter. Like there was one guy um, who came into the gym who was a black belt and he's a little bit older. I rolled with him and he it was a very much of a sort of flowy style, style roll. You know, and he was telling me afterwards, he's like, hey man, like thanks for not killing me. He's like, sometimes I go to gyms and they want to like crush me, right? Mm -hmm. And then I rolled with another guy who was like a black belt, and when we started locking up. I could feel the tenseness in his muscles, and I knew it was going to be it was going to be a tough roll. So we're going to roll. We're going to roll hard, right? So you just kind of follow the uh, follow the lead with that kind of just. But again, I like to do I like to follow the lead when people come to the gym, so this way they can kind of like almost pick their pick their poison. How how hard do you want to go with this thing today? Right. And I'll kind of follow along because you never know. Some someone might be on vacation. They may not want to go hard, you know. And sometimes they might want to go hard, and you just kind of give them what they what they want to do, you know. Like we had a. We had a black belt come in last night, mm -hmm. and uh, he he rolls hard. He's tough really? roller. I didn't get to roll him, but he he rolls stuff. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I didn't get a chance to roll him. Yeah, he's a. You could I could tell see, seeing him. He was like he's like he's a tough roll, and he was even saying he's like he was looking at some of the gyms in the city, and uh, he was like I see that these gyms were associated with this particular name, and he's like usually where we're down from, he's like that means they're it's kind of a soft gym. He's like so uh, really? he's like I was looking for. He's like I wanted to get some rolling while I'm up here, so <laughs> so he came up there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think you've uh, you've always said to to. People have asked that question to match the intensity. You kind of let them, if you're a guest at, at a gym, let them kind of set the pace, set the tone. Yeah. I mean, just being respectful. Right. Because, you know, like you and I, we can pick, I mean, because we, we do this on a day to day basis. Like, if, if you, you, we'll kind of go with each other and find, find our rhythm, right? And, but we've been training for so long, we can do that. When someone else comes from another gym, you know, you don't know each other. And so I tend to find that it helps them 
if I sort of ease into it with them and sort of find the, the find our rhythm together. Sure. All right. Guys, if you have any questions, throw them out there because we're answering them. So if you have any questions you'd like to throw out before we're done today, uh, throw it out there. Uh, let's see. Here's one from J. William 86. So, Chewy, you're a businessman. Not really. Uh, what advice do you have on opening a BJJ, BJJ gym? Also, what's the least amount of experience you should have to open one? Um, okay. Here's what I'm going to say about this. So, first off, if you're going to open up a gym, I would take a long time. This is the way that I would do it. And this is the way that I have done it. I, I didn't. We didn't originally open up my gym that I'm in currently. We actually bought it from a friend. I was there teaching and basically building the gym up. Yeah. And then I bought it from him afterwards because you know that owner at that point was no longer doing anything. But my friend and you'll see him. He's actually in the group right now, uh, trolling you guys with questions. Joe Clark. Um, that is my business partner. With Joe and I, we complement each other, right? Because basically, Joe does the things that I'm not good at, and I do the things Joe's not good at. Right, like we basically we understand our roles in the business and we work together. I don't think that this gym would be as successful as it is. I don't think that you guys would see me in the videos like like I am if I did not have Joe. The reason being is I would have too much on my plate that I'm not good with, and I would be balancing way too much if I didn't have him. So one thing I would say is find people. You may find it beneficial to have a partner. Some people don't like to because if they get a business partner and they're not willing to look at their own bullshit and see what they suck at, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Because people, a lot of times, they realize what they do. And this right. was something I struggled with, right? You realize what you do, but then sometimes you don't realize what that other person brings to the table. So you have to like take a step back and look at it for what it is and appreciate that other person, just like you would in a, like a marriage, like a relationship, right? Um, but you may find it beneficial to have a partnership. That said, as far as experience goes, I would say go out and build yourself up. Train hard. Go compete. If you want to compete, you don't have to. But go have experiences. Go go to seminars if you're not competing, right? Take that money that you'd spend on the, the competitions and go do seminars. Learn from all sorts of people. Go fill your cup up. Fill it up with so much stuff. And then when it's time, come around. The thing that I think people a lot of times now, from what I've seen, I don't know if it's always been this way. Like when I first got into it, jiu-jitsu, owning a gym was not really a thing. It was like nobody was making any money by it. So I was just doing it because I loved it because I love being in there. Now I get a lot of these people that are like blue belts and they're like, man, I want to open up my, open up my gym. I'm like, you want to open up a gym now? Like, dude, go, go, unless, unless you're in a place where there is no gym, go, go do things, go experience so that you have something to give because once you start coaching, right? Like you have to focus on other people. You don't get to just focus on you. You have to say, listen, I've got this thing. It's full and I got to dole it out to everybody else. And you got to make sure that damn thing is full. Cause if it's not, you're not going to be helpful. The only reason that I can be as helpful as I am to my students, to people in the videos and everything else that I do is because I, I messed up a lot of stuff. I had a lot of experiences and I trained a ton before I ever said, Hey, I'll be the guy. Right. And I didn't even want to be the guy. The guy kind of fell into my lap. So what I would say is, and I see these young guys, it just seems like it's a thing now. Like everybody just wants to jump to the front. Go build yourself up. Go apprentice. Go be, become a master at what you're doing and then come back around and say, all right, it's time. And what you could do is you could start training. And maybe when you're like a purple belt or brown belt, ask your coach, say, hey, would you mind if I teach a class once a week? Right? Because teaching will make your jiu-jitsu better and it will help you develop the ability to teach. Because I'll tell you right now, it may seem easy, right? If you get around a good teacher in jiu-jitsu, it seems so easy that these guys can just, they're just like, you know, throwing this stuff off their, off, you know, like as they're going through stuff. But it's a skill and you have to develop it and it's a lot harder than what it looks. And so if you're going to start teaching, you're going to become a coach and you're going to own a gym, you need to get that stuff in place too. So you need to develop not only your ability to execute techniques, but you also need to get your ability to translate information from one person to another in a very simple form. People wouldn't like to do this, but I think teaching kids would be an excellent way because if you can break down complicated stuff and break it down into like little tidbits that little kids can get, then you can, you can, yeah. and plus with kids, you've got to be entertaining because if you're not entertaining, they're going to be bored to tears. So it's a hard thing to do, but it will make your jiu-jitsu teaching so much better. That said, the last thing I'll say is that maybe, maybe you don't want to actually teach at the gym. You just want to own one. And in that case, you go find a really good instructor and you can run a business. But I think that ultimately I would find people that would support me in areas that I'm deficient in and then find a, you know, just give it time. Don't be in any rush. Let it come. The, the universe will throw it your way if it's something you really want. But in the meantime, Dedicate yourself to yourself and your training so that you can build yourself up so that when it's time, you can come around and build other people up. Nice. All right. Whew. 
Here's a uh, here's one. Okay. Bryant Campbell. Bryant Campbell. I am a new white belt, and I can only get to class twice a week. What more can I be doing while I'm outside of class so that I can get the most out of my training? Read that again for me, please. Again? Yeah. Sorry. No, no. It's a, I, I'm I, a new white belt, mm -hmm. and I can only get to class twice a week. Okay. What more can I be doing while I'm outside of class so that I can get the most out of my training? Um, first off, when you come to class, be ready to go. But diet, exercise, uh, maybe do a little bit of lifting or maybe go for some walks. Um, proper sleep. Make sure you're getting a lot of sleep as much as possible. Get that seven to eight hours. Um, and be okay with two days a week. A lot of people, a lot of people, for some reason, find that like, oh, I can't wait to do two days a week, dude. Are you going to be a world competitor? Like, you don't need to train every single day. Like, I mean, like, think about this. Like, you can get pretty, pretty damn strong in three days a week of lifting, right? So, two to three days a week of jujitsu is going to be just fine, right? Like, I mean, you, you'll be okay on that. Like, a lot of people want to do more because you know maybe some people in their gym are doing more, and it's this race of like who can get better, whatever. But be okay with two days a week. Two, two, two days a week is fine for the average person. Make sure though. You got to think that the better off your vehicle is, you know, your little little flesh suit with bones and stuff in the middle, the better off that thing's doing, the better off your jiu-jitsu is going to be. So if you're eating a good diet, you're getting proper rest so your body can recover from those training sessions and so you can push it when you get back. And you are maybe doing a little strength training on the side or maybe some like some some, you know, movement drills and things like that. That kind of stuff's only going to go a long way to help out. Um, but I think doing all that stuff on the side, maintain a good healthy lifestyle, and then be okay with your two days a week and give them everything that you have on those two days a week. And that'll be fine. You'll, you'll, you'll see gains. Yeah, I like watching um, I like watching videos. I like seeing techniques mm -hmm. or breakdowns or something you've been working on. Maybe take some notes on a YouTube video or something. Yeah. I think, you know, don't get into the weeds with crazy, crazy techniques. But just like if you're a brand new, um, you know, white belt or whatever, how about a scissor sweep or a basic triangle set up from guard or whatever it is. You know? I, I used to watch tournaments all the time. Yeah, that's great too because it's live. Yeah, yeah. You're just watching. Like, you're just like watching what people are doing. Right. You know, I like, can just, you'll, you're you like taking it through just like being rubbed off one. Even if you don't think you're taking anything in, you're learning stuff that yeah. way. Yeah, and, and visualization sure. as well. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Um, let's see here. Kyle Hensley, Jiu Jitsu, on a previous podcast, you mentioned you liked reading a lot. Uh, any recommend or book rec recommendations? doesn't have to be BJJ related. Man, there's so many. Um, I, uh, gosh, there's so many books that you could read. I have, I, I don't know where to go. I'm reading here. I'll tell, I'll tell you this one. I'm reading a good one right now. Um, it's uh, called Mind on Fire. It's about uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I'm a big Emerson fan. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's fun to read. He's got some good stuff out there. But um, American Transcendentalist, some good American literature. But what I like about it is because I, I've really enjoyed this thing with um, biographies because when you read a biography that's not written by the person, right, so it's written by someone else, looking at them objectively, you get to see what the person did, right, and how they did it, mm -hmm. not what they're saying. Because, like, Emerson, he was this big guy about, like, you know, follow your heart, you know, you, uh, the powers in you, you know, all these things that, you know, people say today, right, uh, all these, like, truths that we, we, we sort of uh, ascribe to today, but... In the back, in the background, he was he he had tomes like these journals. There were just tons of them, right? And these journals, he would talk about you know his own insecurities, his own problems, you know, and like how he's dealing with it. He you know, and he was dealing with his own issues as he's writing this stuff for other people. He's like, this is the this is the way I see the way, but I'm still dealing with myself. And I always found that really interesting, you know. And there's some really good gems in that thing. Um, so that's a book that I'm reading right now. Um, I typically I typically on my nightstand at the house, I typically have like Seneca's letters. Um, I've got uh, Dao Te Ching. It sits, it sits there. Just it's something I can open up at night and just kind of pass through and look through. And then um, uh, there's I, I did a blog about it. There's a really good Joseph Campbell book that I read uh, last year, and I just found it randomly when I was in a bookstore one day. It's a beautiful book. Um, it's not written by him. It's a woman who um, th there was a seminar that went on that where they worked together um, and she was teaching stuff and she took the stuff that she did at the seminar along with a bunch of his writings and combined it into this really it's, it's like a it's called like a, a companion for Joseph Campbell. It's a yellow book. I did a blog post for it. You can look that up. Um, I guess the last one would be uh, there's a really good book. I read it like once a year. Um, the, uh, the Alchemist. It's a really short read by uh, Paulo Coelho. Um, so it's a really short read, but it's a, it's a fun book. It's a metaphorical um, story, like a metaphorical um, fictional story about following your own path. And uh, it's it's a fun read. So, hmm. yeah, so I, I really enjoy it. So, I mean, there's a few things for you, but, I mean, there, there's so many good books out there. I could just ramble on, you know, for a whole episode in the podcast for, for books. Joe Clark, one more class. All right. 
How, Joe, Joe's asking about the blue belt. Somebody told him 300 classes. So, guys, listen. <laughs> I, I'm just going to let you guys know this. Maybe uh, maybe this will be helpful. So, Joe is, again, my business partner. He, he does a little jiu-jitsu, and he's uh, super strong. We have a video coming out this week, I think, of us uh, doing some strength training. The guy's uh, super strong and uh, powerful. But uh, Joe's just, he says that all the time. He asks me that all the time. He's like, well, how many more classes do I have to do to get a blue belt? He doesn't actually mean it. He's just goofing. I think Adam said he's going to give you a blue belt. Uh, next time he better not <laughs> he already gave out a brown belt <laughs> not really but it was fun that, that was fun like to see that video was kind of fun oh it's hilarious everyone was joking around and like that, that's that's the kind of the well and that's another thing that you couldn't do gym. that's another that's thing you gym. couldn't do Don't in a worry. super traditional gym you know what I mean like it's, it's just one of those things where you know they played a prank on me you know um, so there were a couple questions on like okay and, and and so I, I I saw them somewhere. One question was, it's an older. He's an older guy. Mm. He's having a hard time keeping up with the younger yeah uh, jujitsu practitioner. Mm-hmm. And then a younger guy, uh, it's your boy, thirty four. It, it's your boy. Said so. I'm twenty two. So I'm a twenty two year old white belt, and I roll hard and strong. Sometimes I roll against older, higher belts, and I don't know if I should go as hard as I like, and my rolls get worse. Uh huh. So how should I approach? So let's talk about the old guy. The old guy going against a young guy, and a young guy going against maybe an older, possibly more experienced guy. Okay. You shouldn't compare yourself to other people. Like, why are you comparing yourself to other people? Like, I mean, that's that's a big problem. Like, I mean, no, no. What I'm saying is, is, is if you're going into the gym and you're like, I'm an old guy trying to keep up with these young guys. You're not going to, man. Like, they're young. They've got youth. It just, it, it is what it is. So what should you do different? Like. You know, slow the game down. You can try. Okay. Or you just simply accept it for what it is. That like sometimes like these young guys are probably going to be able to beat you and you're just simply going to have to accept it. Now you can try to use technique and slow things down, but there is a point where I don't know how old he is, but man, if you take a, a, a if you take guys that are around the same skill level and you put like an athletic 22 year old, you know, against like a guy who's in his like late 40s, 50s, it just is what it is, man. Like it sucks. Right, mm-hmm. but again, even me, as I've gotten old, I'm not even old yet. Right, I'm in my like early 30s, but I still feel like, like for instance, if I if I roll hard, it takes forever for me to recover compared to some of the younger guys. Right, yeah, you know, even though I'm more technical than them, it just is what it is. Right, so I would say first off, don't compare yourself to others. Now you can try to slow down, the, slow down by getting better grips and using certain positions. This is a given, but ultimately. Just don't try to keep up with them. Do play your game as best you can, but don't keep up with them. Don't even try to play that game. Play your game to the best of abilities, but don't worry about what they're doing. Worry about what you can do. And if that means that all you're doing for that round is trying to like ball up and not get submitted by a 22 year old, well then that's what you're doing. And that's okay, right? That's that's it. Again, we get into this problem where we try to compare ourselves only by our, our by the you know, we you have to compare a little bit because you got to kind of see where you're at, right? You kind of see like, well, how am I doing against them today? But again, don't compare yourself. Think about what's going on. Think about the grips you could use. Think about what happened in that position. Why was he able to pass your guard? Why were they able to do these things? Don't go, well, I, I can't keep up with these guys. That's not useful. Think about like, hey, what are they doing to beat you in this these rounds? What are they beating you to the punch on the grips? What are they doing? Think of it objectively, not taking judgment upon yourself and the fact that you're too old or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's the, the thing that I'm no, trying to get across. Younger guy going against older guy. What do you do? I slow it down. I mean, people can do whatever they want to do. Now, if the younger guy has a skill advantage or he knows he can smash the person, right? Like, let's say you get a younger guy who knows he can just put it on this older guy. I'd say dial it down a little bit. And again, you know, I'm not saying you got to flop over and let him submit you. What I'm saying is, though, be mindful that at some point you're going to be the old guy, right? Like, someday you're going to be the old guy rolling with that young guy. Everybody's going to come back around. So what I would say is allow them to... Allow, allow some play to happen. Like, roll with them. And again, if they go hard and you got to go, you got to go. Because, I mean, there's plenty of old guys in our gym, and I mean old like in their 40s, that if you're not on it, they're going to get you, right? Like, I mean, like, you know, we have guys that are like these, you know, old like guys in their 40s that are doctors and like lawyers and stuff. And if you if you play around, you can get smashed. So yep. you got to do what you got to do. But if it's someone where you know you have an, a market advantage over that person, just ease up a little bit. Ease off the gas pedal. You'll have those younger guys to roll with on that way. But again, to me, I would like to have more training partners. And at that point, I can kind of play around with a little bit more technique. I mean, I ease up my game a lot when I roll with guys that are a bit smaller than me or guys that I know I can control easily. So I try to play around a little bit more. Again, I think that you're not going to roll with anybody exactly the same. Everybody's a little different, right? They're down to their games and the way that they play and their style and even their own physical attributes, right? Like, so if I roll with a smaller guy, I'm gonna ease up on the pressure, but I don't wanna hurt him, right? If I'm going with a bigger guy, I'm gonna have to put some more pressure on. If I'm rolling with someone that's a little faster, I might have to lock him up a little bit. If I'm rolling with someone slower, maybe I move faster. 
but I'm going to adjust again. And I think that everybody should have the ability to switch gears, right? Like you're not going to be in the, you're not going to be in your fast gear all the time. Sometimes you can put it back a little bit. So yeah. All right. That's what I would say. Man. All right. Chewy, here's one. BM Customs. Chewy, do you struggle with your own ego at times? Hell yeah, I do. We all do. It's always just being coming conscious, though. Like, you know, you, you become aware of it. I think that's the biggest thing is you bring awareness to it when you realize, like, because, again, the ego is a tool. We all have an ego. It's, it's hey, my name's Chewy or my, my name's Nick, whatever the hell you guys want to call me, right? And I, I have this thing. I do this gym and I train and, and I, you're basically who you think you are, right? And that's cool, but at the same time, you got to remember that that's a tool and not the master. And when you start getting frustrated with yourself because of the expectation that your ego is set, well, then the, the, the tools become the master. And then there's where we have a problem. And that's when you got to catch it, bring it back. Like even this morning. This morning was a great example. I was rolling with my, my buddy Tony Blackbelt. Tony's a, he's a tricky guy, man. He's got, some, he's got some, some moves, some tricky moves under his sleeve. And when we were rolling, he caught me in a shoulder lock. Right, he, he he got rubber guard, put me in a shoulder lock, and I remember because I you know I just finished rolling with those tenth planet guys, and I know to keep the pressure and how to like adjust to it, but I kind of was like ah, I'm good, you know I just felt fine, and he he made me pay for it, and I remember at first there was an there's this instant right little instant where all of a sudden I, I wanted to well back you know I wanted to be like damn it I got caught I wasn't I was, I didn't want to get caught I was like I was trying to roll today I was rolling hard so I got caught I was like mm, like at, for a second. Caught it. I was like, good. And I started congratulating him. I was like, dude, good yeah. job, dude. That was awesome. Caught me. It was like, caught me, caught me sleeping, man. Put it to me. That's awesome. You know, and for me, this is something where I talk about this all the time. Jiu-Jitsu gives you these little, like, you know, it's like a, it's like, you know, the, something throwing the ball at you, like a little pitching machine, right? It's, it's throwing the balls at you every now and then, and you get to take a swing at yourself, right? What I mean by the swing, the, the, the ball being like nasty sides to your personality, because they don't, a lot of times we have these nasty sides to our personality that don't come up too often. They only come when we're stressed. They come under when we're in the pressure cooker or when something happens that we don't like. And so it's like a pitching machine. It threw me a ball, right? It's done this over time. When I was younger, I used to get pissed. I used to get so frustrated. But I realized eventually that it was so stupid. What am I doing? I'm not helping myself. I'm getting more frustrated. My, my training partners don't want to train with me afterwards because, you know, I would get angry that they submitted me. Like, and then who am I to think that I'm not supposed to ever be submitted? That's bullshit. So now when it happens, I have trained myself because I took a swing at these, these balls have been thrown at me, right? When these nasty sides of my personality, when I can feel that little irritation come up, I squash it, right? I squash it immediately and say, oh, man, good job. Because that turned into something positive, right? You got me. Good job. We're, yeah. pl we're playing the game, man. You beat me today. I'm cool with that. You know, and again, I think that's you, you have to be mindful. We all have an ego, and you just have to become conscious and aware of it. All right. Well, we've been on an hour and 30-something minutes. An hour and 30 minutes. So, you want to do one more? Let's one, do one more. One more. You pick it, I, <laughs> and we'll, we'll rock it out. All right. Here we go. So, uh, Rye Man Show 66. All right. I'm a four strike white belt and I tapped a purple belt recently. Four strike white belt tapped a purple belt. Okay. How much value should I put on uh, on mm -hmm. it? I don't think much. I mean, it depends. It's a, I mean, because, I mean, were you guys at a competition? Were you just rolling in your gym? I'll tell you this right now that I, I think that sometimes, like, you know, like I'll roll with, I've got caught by some of my blue belts before because I'm playing around with something, you know, and I'm not rolling my absolute A game. So again, you know, I would say be happy you did it, but don't think of it as like, oh man, I submitted this purple belt going full speed. Because more than likely, they probably weren't going full speed. They were probably like playing around with something and you caught them. Good for you. But again, be happy that you did it, but again, don't take too much stock in it, right? Meaning don't think, well, oh, I, I submitted a purple belt. I'm supposed to be a blue belt now. No, no, no. Like that's not the way it works. Like, you, you got a purple belt. Good for you. You don't know what was going on. Right, like just like the the one day where I came in two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whatever it was, uh, when I came to training, and uh, you know my brown belt was beating the dog dog crap out of me. Right, taking my beating doesn't mean he's like I'm better than Chewy. It means he got me that day. He he was on it, and I wasn't. Right, mm -hmm. it just those things happen. Um, you know, I mean, I, I went against a guy in a competition as a um, as a white belt, and beat a beat a purple belt as a white belt. I guarantee you, if I rolled that guy ten times, he would have beat me the other nine. Right, I, I got him once. I don't think it would have happened again, right? Again, you have your days. Every dog has his day, you know? And again, a lot of times, I remember there was a situation years ago where we had a white belt um, that was training, and, uh, you know, she was tough, super tough. 
But I remember, you know, the guys were kind of like helping her out. And I remember one day she was telling me, she goes, yeah, I submitted one of the black belts today. I was like, who? Or no, it was a, uh, Tony was a brown belt at the time. She's like, yeah, I submitted Tony. I'm like, you know, I looked at her. I was like, you didn't submit Tony. She's like, no, no, I, I made him tap. I'm like, well, you made him tap, but he was probably letting you work, right? Because he's trying to be helpful. And she's like, I don't think so. I think he was going full speed. And I was like, Tony, I was like, Tony, next time you roll through, like, like give her the fill, right? Because again, Tony has gears. Tony, yeah. can, Tony can play and Tony can be like, I'm going to go hard. Right, and it's the same thing. I was like, okay, well, here I'm going to let you feel what it's like to go against Chewy going full speed, and you're going to see what this is like. And then they're like, oh, there's a gear there, right? Like there's something different. So again, you know, if you submitted them, great. Don't make a big fuss about it because you're probably going to get submitted by plenty of people over time. Be happy you did it. Be be submitted. I caught him, cool. But don't get too wrapped up in it. I guess is where I'm trying to get at. You know, just. Take it for what it is. They were, they may have been playing. They may have been going full speed. I don't know. Just take it. Be excited about it and keep on moving. Yeah. Because again, you're, you're going to submit people sometimes, and sometimes you're going to get smashed too. Yeah. All right. Um, question from Chubbs Peterson: When is my Jiu Jitsu podcast shirt going to be available? Boom. So I'm Chubbs. Gonna, so I, I'm gonna see me? I'm gonna look at getting the podcast shirts up by next week. So if you guys want to buy one, we'll, when we do the podcast next week, I'll talk about them. Um, again, the shirts themselves are gonna go to help support the uh, podcast. As you can see, we're continuously trying to upgrade stuff, um, and eventually we'll have everything going. But again, it's this stuff costs some money, so this isn't cheap stuff. So it's just a way to help support the podcast if you enjoy listening to it. Yeah, if you love it, subscribe and leave us a, a five star review. We love that. Yeah. It helps us out and uh, helps us grow and. Gets more people on the podcast, more fun interviews and things right. like that. Well, and, you know, one of the things for you guys listening is, again, you guys come in on these these live podcasts or you're listening, like, on iTunes or whatever you're doing. And so, um, you know, a lot of you guys, like, you know, you're here on multiple times each week. So, again, you guys must like it. So, again, it, it really helps us out if, you know, again, to spread the word and everything else. If you just do a, a, a short review, literally two minutes out of your day, just to put a star on something and be like, awesome podcast, whatever you want to put. Um, but if you could definitely give it a review if you enjoy it and you want us to keep going and uh, it just helps us out with uh, t basically to know that there's some interest into it and it also helps us you know let other people know about it as well right and if there's anything that you guys want to see any suggestions I mean we're open to that as well we mm -hmm. love hearing that see if we can make any modifications make things even better so yeah and again this little mic here in the center um, we're eventually going to work on replacing everything. It just takes time. But again, if you want to hear the the nice mics here, check out the the podcast on the iTunes or Stitcher. Or iTunes, it Stitcher. Uh, what's the other one? I don't know. There's some other ones. Yeah. Just forever podcasts. Are <laughs> so, all right, guys. Well, thank you all. We'll see you next week for another episode of uh, the podcast. Appreciate you guys.